six thirty one, calling the July fifteenth select board meeting to order. Uh, first item is consider additions or adjustments to the agenda. I assume that there are a few. Um, do believe that there's a conversation on the bond for the Jewett property. That a good header. Bond and warning. Warning. Bond and warning. Okay. Okay. Duncan, you had a short update on the assessors. Yeah, you can be level. very sure. Okay. Hang on. Are there any further additions or adjustments to the agenda? Update on 100C and River Road East. Yep. I know that we had talked about an informational sheet for the project. I know, I know we still, we have, we're going to have to make some adjustments there, but should we still talk about it and maybe get some guidance from who might want to work on that ever. For the public meeting? Yeah, for the bond, the bond yeah. information. Oh, we can certainly talk about that underneath that one topic. Okay. It's all things to a property or industrial business part. Any further additions? Hearing none. Uh, our next item is review invoices and orders. I believe those are being passed around. Item number three is public comment. We have a full house here today. <laughs> Any comment from the public? Thank you for coming. Uh, nice to be here. Yeah, much more space. Wide open spaces. Right. <laughs> Item number four is select board issues or concerns. I have a couple, but does anybody else have any? No, Mr. Chairman. I have. Two that were brought to my attention. Go for it. Well, um, the first one was brought to my attention by Lois, which we're going to discuss, which is the warning. Um, the second one was um, uh, a request, or not necessarily a request, but an observation that when these meetings are recorded, it's really hard for people to hear the comments from the public. And I know Tom has indicated that he's going to Try and address that situation, but it may it may be something where we need to actually ask people to come up and speak into the microphone so that their comments can be um, recorded. Yeah, I know Lois raised the same question with regard to the village trustee meeting. You just couldn't hear. I believe Tom has a microphone set up that way, and there's a little black yeah. line for people to stand, you know, up to. Yeah at the meeting so we'll just have to be conscious and we'll just have to be conscious to ask people to do that like david williams does at town meeting he yep. has the microphone <laughs> i'll also say it would not be that expensive for us to get another mic that would capture people from up, further yeah. back um so i don't think we own any of these do we oh yeah these are all uh, gma tv i think could that be a request tom maybe I bet we, would, we could I bet just they ask. Yeah, um, they they, they might have one. Yeah, additional microphones. Uh, 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 specifically, um, uh, I mean, uh, just any kind of shotgun mic that would pick up direction. The, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, we brought that one specifically, and we sat here and tested it. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. great for people like if they go up and, and speak into it. The a, a directional, like Duncan was saying. Just if you point it at the crowd, it's going to pick up all of the noise coming in. It won't, you know, it's not going to be as good quality as that, but people listening to the recordings will be able to hear. Um, Don. Yeah. And I, I guarantee you they've got one of those. Okay. Um, I have some flood updates if the board wants them. We had water. <laughs> Um, no major infrastructure damages known um, and uh, that I know of. Nobody was displaced kind of like last year, which was nice. 
out of that, there are a couple of spots that I'm not sure if Tom could follow up or talk with Jason. Um, it was brought to my attention. There's a property on River Road West that is adding material. Um, if they're in the floodplain, they should go through the floodplain administrator. If if it's bringing back to the same height that was, I'm sure that's fine. Uh, the other thing is silt from projects on private properties flooding in to the public right away. It was kind of certainly more apparent with the storm. There's three locations. One is Gould Hill, one is River Road East, and one is Sinclair Road. I'm not sure if we have a policy or if we need a policy or if a and R would take care of that, but it's River Road. It's troublesome in the middle of Yeah, River Road West, Gould Hill. What was the other one? Sinclair Road. Sinclair. Oh, I know. Yep. And that was really the class four part of it, right? No. No, it was before you got off the asphalt. That's oh, still, still coming down. On oh, that's oh. coming out of coming out of your Fairbanks driveway there. I did not give any names. Of course not. Is that clear? Any other questions? We're good. On that, I'll just say, uh, you know, for the record, I think it was awesome to see the fire department get out proactively. And I heard a lot of positive feedback about that. Um, also awesome to see the town and village crews ready to go, um, learning lessons from our experiences as bad as they've been. But, um, you know, just kind of nice to know that the next time the worst happens, we're ready to deal with it and, and we've got people who, who know what they're doing. So anybody listening, make sure you say thank you to the <laughs> all the crews involved. Was Jason but thank you for that. Out of town for the whole thing? Uh he got back in on Saturday. That's pretty pretty mm -hmm. impressive. Everybody has been at hard at work. Yeah, they went out and again, put water yeah. bars in the day before. And, yep. Uh, we all knew it was coming. We had a heads up. <clears throat> yep. So, uh, there wasn't a single event that exceeded the $3,800 threshold to the roads, which is really impressive. That's great. And so they do a lot of uh, preventative measures like with yeah. oh, water there's bars. There's two moving. that <laughs> might exceed it where there's like bank destabilization mm. what about the culvert up on french hill that wasn't more than that no very cool yeah i think yeah there's maybe Lenway, but it's already under control and then maybe river road east depending on what they say but and yeah. i'm not sure if you got a chance to follow up with jason today or not but there is a citizen on french hill um i'm gonna have to read this so bear with me um they're claiming that the town moved some boulders around nah. um over the hill and that has locked the top of their spring and is now full of crap and it needs to be fixed the town is liable so you need to do something that's just a direct quote I did speak with Jason. It does appear that the bank is moving towards their spring with stones that were probably placed there to stabilize it many years ago. Uh, there's moss on those stones, so it appears it wasn't a recent event, but something that's been happening over some time. Um, and it's unclear if the town is liable for, uh, for that. Um, and so I think Although it's really frustrating, I'm sure it's terrifying that our water source is, um, but I think it needs more investigation. And generally, in the past, at least, when something like that said, we've notified the insurance carrier, and the insurance carrier will conduct its own investigation, mm -hmm. because if there's liability, they might be on hook to pay. Got it. Um, so I would I would contact that's a the really the other arm of DLCP. Yeah. Yeah. Passive. What do they call themselves these days? I hope it's good because I just plug my car into that charger out there. And if we hear a big explosion. Yeah. That charger's gone. Oh boy. So we have the insurance people on speed dial. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all of my issues and concerns and quick updates unless anybody else has any. We can discuss them if not. 
I guess we're going on to spending money. Why did we have to follow up with that? Oh, it's nice to have the AC work. Tom, would you like to present on the plan purchase? I mean, just the overall ask. Uh, I do believe it was in Randall's report. I don't have the page open. Yes. I believe the um, request was for an amount not to exceed $6,000 that the town will be reimbursed for. Correct. So this is going to ultimately be paid by the Vermont Community Rural Development um, as part of the July 20th, our next Monday's meeting. However, um, they need to get paid before that check would come through it from the Vermont Community Foundation. So it has to come from the Community Foundation to us. Um, and then we're not going to get that money in time. And so can we pay for this not to exceed and then knowing that it will be reimbursed by the Community Foundation? What are the board's wishes on this expense? I think we got to do it. Um, we don't have to, but if you would, we could make a motion. I, I would like for there to be dinner at this event, and uh, you know, it, it is going to be reimbursed. So um, I'll make a motion to authorize spending up to six thousand dollars for the meal for the uh, July twenty second Reimagine Johnson event. With the understanding that it will be reimbursed. Yeah. That was the number you gave, right, Tom? Yeah. Well, Rand it's Randall is forty-seven fifteen. Okay. Yeah, but if you read the full report, there was mention of six thousand dollars. Yeah, it's like okay. I hope to negotiate six thousand from BCF for to allow for possible unexpected costs. Um, so I'll second the motion for up to. $6, motion and a second. Is there further discussion? I do see we have a member of the audience if the select board doesn't have any further discussion. Can you step up to the line, please? Not past the line, just at the line. I just, I just have one question. Is that for all three meetings? Six thousand dollars? Um that's a good question. I don't think so. I hope so. Uh, it does. I mean, let's see what sorry, it says report. Total food, which is the cabinet. So, Lois, uh, the exact bowl was $4,715.13 from two sons, uh, bakery $139.80, uh, for printing 20 hours of child care at 273. Um, so the total for everything comes out to $5,128.33. But in that estimate is 150 hot dogs, 150 hamburgers, 50 pizzas, potato salads, and such. It seems like that would be three separate meals, but I don't know. It does not specify the problem. Yeah, that, that would be my guess, given the numbers I'm seeing here, that it would be multiple meals, but we can drill that up. They're quite optimistic about having several hundred people there. Uh can I can I speak to that for clarification? Certainly. Absolutely. Yeah. My my understanding <clears throat> my understanding is that there's a the initial meal is the the more hamburger hot dog things. And I think the subsequent meals are intended to be pizzas at least that's how it was described to me that the the other ones are less of an event because the other ones also don't have music etc but they are going to at least provide some level of food that was my understanding okay further discussion from the board thank you randall all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. all those opposed yeah the ayes have it It's not very many people here for our rec committee report. Uh, Tom does have a write up about it. Is there anything more that you would like to speak to that wasn't in the packet? Um, I think that's that's pretty much it. I did speak to Lisa Cruz and she uh, agreed that there really isn't an active committee and hasn't been really since COVID. So it's been, it's not a recent event, but they haven't been active for some time. Okay. Um, I would definitely be supportive of us, of us putting those vacancies. I guess we need to figure out what 
exactly we have for vacancies um who that was involved in the past might be interested in returning um and then posting those vacancies so we can fill out the committee uh i also think yeah you know, and randall sent me a lot of information so if, actually if randall wants to speak to that that'd be great but uh this is an opportunity as i've kept saying for us to look at recreation as a whole and think about the role that it plays in our community think about the role it could play in our community um, and one of the things that randall brought to my attention is that towns of our size elsewhere in vermont are investing a lot more in recreation than we are and they're getting some major payback from that those investments um in you know recreational activities coming to their town using their town as a home base for biking tours for for races 5ks etc cetera, etc cetera. um i think there's a lot of opportunity for that and getting there will require a little bit more investment but making that investment makes johnson a hub for this uh which you know i've been saying for years i think a lot of people agree this should be a place that is seen as a hub for recreation uh and you know it it's on us that to make that investment. But if, if Randall, if you want to speak to some of the numbers that you had provided me, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, I got if I got the mute off here. Um, I mean, it's in the report uh, actually that I provided. You know, some of the numbers, the towns, and I took into account those towns median income as a sort of measure you know median median income obviously median family income is not always indicative of like the actual wealth in a community but it's at least some some barometer for comparison and you'll see that there are communities in there that have higher in average median incomes uh but the average median income is not to the threshold of the expenditure meaning you know charlotte which is a very as we all know one of the wealthiest communities in vermont um but their budget still wildly outstrips uh, uh, proportionality uh, to Johnson. But a more comparable town might be like New Haven. New Haven's a very similar community in some ways, and they have a much larger budget as well. Um, again, you know, a, a large budget doesn't always mean that it was spent well either. You know, there's a lot, a lot of times, you know, this is just a cursory look at these things. So I, I, I understand that there's always details to everything. Um, but one of the things that I pointed out uh, also was because I had made mention of it in a previous report is, you know, the Mad River Valley kind of has formed many years ago in the 90s, a, a recreation district, which is essentially its own municipality. And Faiston, Waitsfield and Warren all sort of con contribute a, a fee towards that uh, recreation district. And that's what funds their recreation activities in all of their towns collectively. I believe they each pay $40,000 a year into that fund. The weird thing about that one is I called and talked to uh, a woman. I can't remember if it was Warren or Waitsfield at this point, um, but I called and talked to her. And the structure of that thing is interesting because they the communities pay into this fund and then they go back before that that sort of municipal entity. And then so almost like make grant applications to fund activities in their towns, which is a little weird, right? Like you put the money in, but there's no guarantee that you're going to get that exact amount of service back. You kind of compete for that. But the way that they kind of create a fairness about it is that there's a governing body made up of members from each community that make the decisions or may help make the decisions with the executive director. Anyway, the point of that is just that there are other models out there. There's collaborative models. And I made mention of in the report as well that Londonderry has sort of become the host for what they call the mountain towns around them. Those, all of those towns collectively have hired a position that's going to manage recreation amongst all the towns as well and so it's a way to pool resources and not make one community sort of carry the burden themselves and allow all these smaller towns to kind of pitch in and get a higher quality service in theory anyway yeah as far as the rec committee i agree we should post for vacancies <clears throat> um and hopefully get some interest um that is their committee report for this meeting. But I do agree it's opportunity. It's just when you, when you start filling the seats. What model do you want for the future of recreation? It feels like there was a solution where you started with a group of volunteers and then it worked into a town committee. And then that committee kind of turned into a hybrid of a coordinator and a committee. 
and that kind of fell apart at that time. And so do you want to continue with the committee coordinator or is that do you want to try to something different um, where you work? Just seeing how the other committees are operating, it seems as if getting members to join might be hard. And would a stronger coordinator with volunteers for soccer and volunteers <laughs> for baseball, like a key group of volunteers as opposed to a recreation committee, you know, and just, I just want to make it really easy for people to take part. And one of the things I heard at the pavilion was, yeah, I'd love to do that, but I only want to go for two hours and like, you know, just do this. Like my kid plays soccer, so I don't even want to talk about it. I don't even want to go do that. I'll go, I'll, yeah, I'll line the field for you, but I'm not doing anything else. You know, it's and just, you know, what do you, what do you guys want? And what do you see as like the future of recreation? And like, would a stronger coordinator be able to then coordinate those volunteers to lessen their burden, right? Because that, that also wasn't happening. Like Dean was carrying the burden of everything. Um, and so then I think, well, what we were doing wasn't working. I think I just want to say that. Like, it's a good question. <clears throat> Anybody with thoughts on that? I love, I mean, Randall brought up the idea of inter town, inter municipal communication. We already have an interlocal real agreement. We're already pursuing an interlocal agreement on another subject. This seems to me like an area where we could potentially pursue another one and figure out how many towns in the region are willing to buy into something like that at some model or at some level. Um, I'm not sure whether the, you know, the specifics of the, the Warren Wakefield um, model would work for us, but, you know, we can, we can figure something out, I think. Um, and I, I think that that was another thing that we heard in our conversations uh with people who had been involved with their creation was so many of these things are done with cooperation between johnson and hyde park and cambridge and waterville that it sort of makes sense for it to all be under one umbrella um i also think it dovetails with the conversation we had at the last meeting uh about events and uh you know some of the, the uses of public spaces and i think all of this could be under one umbrella um one you know Lamoille County Parks and Recreation Board or something like that, uh, depending on how big it's able to get. But, you know, a regional approach to this, I think, saves us money and allows programming to improve. Uh, and those are both good things. I, I agree with that conceptually. Um, We've we've got a period of time. I don't. That's that's not going to happen overnight. No, and that's that's possibly a two year conversation. Right. Um, in the meantime, <clears throat> I'm not ready to give up on the committee structure yet. Um, uh, it, the recreation committee has seen its members fluctuate over time, um, so it doesn't particularly bother me that we're down to. Very low participation right now. That that's that's not on you. Um, yeah. For that, I, I think we should make a, a strong effort to try and recruit new members um, and people with new ideas. I would also say that our recreation programs have primarily been geared to youth, um, and I think that there's an opportunity for a greater emphasis on, you know, adult recreation. We've had this conversation in the past about, you know, what that would look like, but right now we've just been really focused on, you know, soccer, baseball, t-ball. Gymnastics. Gym, gymnastics. Um, and that's great. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a portion of our population that needs those things, but I think there's also opportunities out there that, you know, for more adults that, yeah. uh, you know, could be that, and, and that could be part of that conversation with the, you know, the more regional yeah. approach to things. Yeah. I would second that, Dr. Because I, and Randall even mentioned it, that <clears throat> there's a lot of other communities that are doing stuff for old people, like, you yeah, know, I go over, I go, not as old as you, but I go over to Hardwick, they have rec trails that I go running on, I take the dogs for walks on, 
and they have activities, mountain biking things. And I, you know, I'd love to have a bocce court somewhere in this town, and maybe pickleball courts and stuff for old people. You know, come after me, Gundy. <laughs> <laughs> Officer Watson, uh, yeah, come after me. After me. <laughs> As a drug sniffing dog, I guess. <laughs> I guess we're looking for a new candidate. <clears throat> the general <laughs> consensus <laughs> is to post for vacancies. Uh, I think everybody thinks it's important that there's room for growth. So if we could get, you know, some people on it and continue to have these conversations to push it forward. Yeah. Uh, right now, rec is just as you said, it kid sports. That's yeah. pretty much where the line is strong. And so that's a great there. foundation. And you need that, but yeah, yeah. And a lot of it is if we can find a dynamic coordinator, one way or the other. I, if you can find somebody that's really excited and passionate. I have been interested in the intermunicipal idea with one other town to have a full time employee. Yeah, and I, I think. There are some efficiencies I think you get there. If we're able to get multiple other towns potentially on board to pay for even just uh, you know one coordinator <clears throat> uh, position to do that, like we can spend more money on that position, we can pay that person more, and then maybe we get someone who is capable of not only coordinating the the grounds and maintenance that we need them to do it, but write grants as well. You know, right. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that's where yeah, I think we can. Really be creative. Pretty soon we're going to have county government. Did I see Margo? Did you have your hand up? Is that just okay to like ask questions or comments? Well, I have a question. Sure. Well, should have got taken care of more. Uh, Tom, you mentioned a few minutes ago about the problem of people lining the fields and everything else. Years ago, that I don't believe there was any problem with that. We we had an individual took care of wreck for seven or eight years, and I never heard. Of any real problem such as that and uh, i think that a dynamic individual or somebody that's uh, really versed and knows how to do the job can certainly take care of all those problems that you see on the horizon yeah and i think something in finding that individual is not somebody who's actually going to line the field but somebody i know somebody's going to make sure that it gets done and that's who the individual is going to be to make sure it gets done and the more uh, volunteers who put in a little bit in, into that now you have everybody a lot more people who have ownership in town and a lot more ownership in recreation and i think that ownership is what carries it out on the next generation or the next group of kids coming up and i think i think to your point somebody dynamic who can like just make sure it happens and you feel good about your sports and you're going to want to be part of it. And I think it's just going to grow and snowball once we get it started. Um, What'd you have, Margo? Well, uh, first can you step up to the mic? Oh, yeah. um, question and then a comment. So are there, do we have the youth, the kids, are they signing up? And do we have a lot of kids wanting to do this? We don't, we're not meeting it with adult coaching and refing. Is that or are we, do we need to also, uh, I'm just curious about the engagement of our, of the kids in the community. Are they signing up for sports? Uh, they have been, yes. Okay. Numbers are down since pre-COVID, but they have been on an upward trajectory the last couple of years. Um, and like a lot of things, it's, it's trying to get back to those pre-COVID levels. And then- We pay our power bill. What's up? We pay our power bill. <laughs> That's getting old. Say it every time. Yeah, they still go out. <laughs> and then I, I just turn it on for an hour. So. Okay. I was thinking about like you know re-energizing, re-engaging the community to to make a vibrant program. You know, we do have things on the horizon, like the July twenty second meeting. You know, reimagining Johnson, and I think that this really could be like probably not the very like. Somewhere in that conversation, I think this could be a part of it. And then along with what's going on at the college, just we can really look up the hill for pickleball courts, pool, climbing wall, gym, trails, farm. Uh, I think there may be some real opportunity in, um, unlike <clears throat> the communities around us, we really have something that's incredible. And I think we really may have an opportunity uh, not wait for it to come to us, but to have conversations with the university about how 
we can utilize uh, some of their resources because they're not being used uh, at, to a great level um, by the students who are there. So it could be, it could really be a wonderful collaboration. Good point. Thank you. Doug? <clears throat> If recollection serves me, I believe uh, there's a meeting on the 17th in Johnson of uh, some of the uh, of our state programs who are interested in the importance of recreation in our community, in communities. And I think that that may not be adult recreation, you know, our programs, but I think that uh, if I'm correct, we ought to have representations and representatives there and understand and see how that's being pushed. And they've had a lot of surveys and uh, in participation and input into that. Thank you. Are you volunteering, Doug? I have a training. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I got to forget those things. We have a real <clears throat> OK. A lot there, Tom, but. I think we're going to keep pushing it forward. Uh, who would the board like to see next month as a future reporting committee? <clears throat> I can throw ideas out there if they want. Please do. Is it me or is our packet kind of discombobulated? There was some things that went on late last week. It took me a while. Kind of the yeah. Um, beautification, they're heavy on summer. Tree board, heavy on summer. Conservation, active year round, but. Maybe beautification. If we do, if we do the tree board or conservation, I would say we just do both. They're, they're very yeah. heavily involved with each other. Or beautification, it's another option. Tree board charges arboretum. Yes. Let's have somebody come in. So I believe in that. Could we yeah. ask tree board and conservation? Yes. There Did the oh. arboretum get flooded, man? Did uh, the arboretum get flooded? Eric said yeah. they were starting to take on water, but he never said. Do you know Lois? I don't know, sure, but who has the Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. And can you send that? Email to Lois for both committees. It'll be the second meeting in August. <clears throat> All right. Tom, could you give us the quick updates on River Road East and Route 100 C? Uh, yes. So um, the health officer visited the property on July 13th been doing by with the visits. Uh, there is a picture. Um, which, which, which one? The River Road East. Okay. Um, and he stayed drove by property in comparison to previous visit. I saw some materials being sorted and some totes had been emptied of material. Um, I will reach out to the landowner beginning of next week to check in and on his general status being. That's, and then 100C. Um, yeah, I drove by uh, yesterday, no, today, um, and it looks like the hole's filled in and the fence has been pushed out to the road and it looks great. I think all we need there is a final inspection report and see if there's anything left to be done. It, from, my, from my view, it looks like it's, it's over. Um, That's, I agree, I drove by there like they could see it sometimes. Oh, I know, it's like one of the better properties in town. It's clean, everything. That's great. Um, Can you follow up and just verify if there's anything that, you know, the board had an order out there? Is there anything that the board needs to do to wrap this up? Do we, do we need to? How to resolve it. Yeah. And formal resolve. Did you add anything to do with the can you 
departments, employee domestic dog, the international. Let me to give an update on that too. Talk about that. I think we were waiting for an update on the dog catcher. Yeah. A... I, I don't know if you saw the email I wrote back to him. I did. Yeah. I did talk to Kim today. Uh, and there was a several weeks where everything was hunky dory and fine. Yeah, there was a pretty appalling incident. Um, she did send a video, I think she sent it to Evan as well. And, but I think we have to see where the line is what what's a dog running at large and what's just a dog running, you know, being a dog. And I think we have to be pretty careful how we report with that. Um, it's not my past experience, you have a dog that usually it ends in a bite. When there's a bite to another animal or a dog, it's very clearly time for a vicious dog hearing. But when a dog is just threatening being vicious, is it vicious? I don't know the answer. Well, vicious dog is defined in the ordinance. So Dean can Dean or BJ can run through look that. to that definition for yeah. whether it qualifies. But clearly the dog is running at large and that means that to was good. exactly yeah, that we can address yes I do believe that's all the brief updates is randall still on uh i am uh yeah. i wasn't going to add to the voluminous amount of words that i <laughs> supplied to you in my report I'm available if you have questions uh, about the report, um, unless you want me to say more. Um, does the board need any more information on the NRDC form that needs signature and approval? Yeah, yeah if that wasn't clear, I'll just, I, I will just summarize that basically when I submitted the previous document, the communication from MBRC is, and I don't know what their internal process is and why they would choose to do it this way, but this is what they communicated. When I submitted that change of authorized official signature, remember we were changing from the previous select board chair to making Duncan the authorized official. When I submitted that, they said, oh, well, aren't you going to be changing, aren't you gonna be submitting a revised work plan and revised budget? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, well, on our end, it's better to do it all in one fell swoop than to uh, do this and then have you send another one and do that. So I guess they have some administrative procedure where they just prefer the most changes that you can do in one unified document and process versus sending in one and then sending in another. So for whatever reason, I just had to essentially fill out that cover sheet. Uh, the, the remaining material that we had submitted is all fine, uh, as far as I know. Uh, and we just revise that cover sheet. And then there's the inclusive of the changes to the budget and the work plan to represent, you know, a while back there was confusion, at least amongst Duncan and I about why the, there was a budget in the LDD for 34, 30, or approximately $34,000. And that was because when the application was submitted, it was the 1% fee for the LDD, which is the kind of our co-administrator fee essentially. The 1% was on the total project budget, but what is actually allowable and customary is 1% of the award amount, which is why it was exactly double what it was supposed to be. So that was, we had to send in a revision with the, the revised $17,000 amount instead of the $34,000 amount. And then because of all the delays that we've had, we had to just essentially just shift everything in the timeline and the work plan to later dates to accommodate the fact that the you know, the reviews and everything haven't happened yet. Randall, I, <clears throat> I had a question on the on the budget adjustment summary sheet. Uh-huh. On that sheet, you've got NEPA costs of 15,300. I was thinking that those fees were estimated by Mumley to be 40,600, 40, yeah, $40,600. Am I, am I wrong in my assumption or? Uh, I am gonna look.
look for your the documents that I have it to reference. I did that revised document with Tori. She and I sat down and we went through the spreadsheet and we went through the document. And I think we had come to the conclusion because I think we were looking at the most updated spreadsheet with all the various figures removed. Um, can we, can you double check that? Because yep. I'm. I I'm still carrying, like in the spreadsheet where we have the, um, you know, the funding stack. Um, I'm still showing forty thousand six hundred under under the NEPA review as a mumly as a mumly number. So if it's if it's fifteen three, that's great. But I just I just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah, I will tomorrow. I'll contact Tori, and uh, we will we will get at that number for you. But it's not fifteen three, right? That would just be our share. Is that thirty thousand six hundred? Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, you see it broken down between HUD share and our share. So yeah, it's really thirty thousand six hundred. Right. Question yeah. remains. I just yeah. Yep. Just, you know, wasn't as drastic as a third right kind of. right it's 10 okay. grand oh you know what that 10 grand might be it might be the ten thousand down below well in any case I just just double check it I guess sure. There is in that spreadsheet that I've got that's the funding stack. It does, there is a section of $10,000 highlighted that says probably not needed. And that's under the phase one environmental assessment. And mm -hmm. that's, that's probably the difference between the 40,006 and the 30,006 that you're carrying. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, this is a document that, you know, you're, you're authorized to sign. It doesn't necessarily need the select board as long as they're all comfortable with and they're in the loop as to why, you know, what the delay is and what the numbers are, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do believe you have authorization already. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> just yeah. a general discussion about this. Yeah. I think we ought to hold off spending any more money until that's the process. Or either even authorize any money to be spent to lack of bond vote. I really believe uh, with this increase in school tax, uh, we did hear some interesting information from the president of the college about the viability of that institution. Uh, but I think that there are some unknowns down the road a couple of years. And let's say that that college ceases to be a college as we know it. There's plenty of property up there that could be developed for an industrial park. And uh, I really believe we need to know the will of the voters in August, whether we're gonna proceed with this or it's just a fool's errand. Because I have a sense that the voters are gonna turn this down, uh, this bond bill. We are going to be talking about it more later on. I don't think the, I don't think we're going to hit the August deadline. Um, this is not authorizing expenditure, is it? It's well, I'm just throwing it out. I I just want to kind of get this on the table that I don't think we need to spend it. Now they're dying until after the bond. Okay. Well, Mike, we have a contract right now with, hang on, I hang understand. On, hang on, let me finish, uh, with Mumley Engineering to do the work on uh, on submitting for an active 50 permit. Are, are you suggesting that we should curtail those activities? 
I'd like to curtail them all because I don't think the voters are going to vote to expend four hundred and twenty thousand dollars on industrial parks. You, you might be right. Who knows? Um, we won't know until the voters vote. But I understand. I guess it. the important question is. But I'm on record with proposing it. You certainly are. This is not actually expending anything, right? It's, this, a, it's a modification this is, to the grant. This is, but no. But I just wanted to point out that we do have an active right. contract, and Mumley is actively based on our vote you know. to proceed to submit an application for Act Two Fifty. And if you, if what you're saying is you think we should stop that, that's a different conversation. Isn't? But it I right? just want to vote. No, I know, but but I I'm trying to I'm trying to honor what you're right honor what you're saying and getting at it. I may disagree with you, but but I, I think you're raising a point that we need to deal with. Mm -hmm. That Act 250 application is part of the 46,500 that's already been allocated. It, it has been, and you know, my own personal belief is that. We should pursue, continue to pursue as per our contract and agreement with Mumley, um, submitting for an Act 250. Beyond that, I probably agree with you that we shouldn't spend any additional money um, until until we find out what that bond vote is. But that's a start, Duncan. Thank you. Temperature of the board, comfortable with that? Yeah. Okay. Are there any further questions from Randall on his report? And I do have one, if I can. Are you planning on attending that TIF conference in October? Uh, I am. I I'm I'm not planning on attending per the board's direction. I mean, it's it's a question of whether the board thinks it's a good use of time. The problem with TIFs is that Johnson is not quite typically the size of a community or resourced the way that a community would be to participate in TIF, but there could be information there that clarifies that or says like, oh, no, actually it is applicable to a town like Johnson. I, I don't know. I just know that, you know, in conversations with Duncan, that had been something that he had mentioned a couple of times, not in any particular way, but he had just brought that up as a, as a point of interest and uh, and it was just a thing that was announced at that conference that there was going to be this this informational event, the first of its kind in Vermont, essentially by White and Burke, who, if you don't know, they have they have worked on almost all the TIF projects throughout the state. So they have a great deal of expertise on the topic. And of course, there'll be people from the State Department of Economic Development there, et cetera, et cetera. But that's something for the board, uh, you know, for the board to decide whether that's a worthwhile thing to, or not. It seems to me something that the trustees ought to be taking the lead on. Seems the downtown. I, I know that when the when they were looking at trying to extend the sewer line out to Jolly's, that Sandy Miller, I think, was the interim manager at the time, and he actually looked into the possibility of creating a PIF for that sewer line extension, but I they obviously didn't do it. So I, I don't know if that means that they looked into it and found it was not feasible or it was something that was new and unusual and they just didn't want to deal with it. I, I honestly don't know what happened, but your your point is is a good one. It, it, if the town and village were one, um, I think that there's a possibility that tips might work. But just the town or just the village, I don't know. Is there a joint meeting scheduled? A what? Joint meeting planned at all? Not right now. Is it on their radar at all? Does anybody know that it's the village? It's definitely on their radar. I've talked with Ken a little bit. Mm -hmm. We'll have one at some point. Sooner the better. Yeah. One thing that I see happening a lot. And if you guys want more meetings, we could. I can, I, I can push I think, one up. Well, that's important to have a meeting with a village. It's been for a yeah. while since they've been. As you see a lot of, like, this is a prime example where, like, 
maybe the village is the best candidate, or we talked about who's going to write the grant for the store. And, but it's, I don't think it matters like who does it, but just making it black and white that, okay, the town's going to head this and like do the heck out of it. And the village is going to head that and do the heck out of it. And, but it feels like sometimes we like kind of pass the ball back and forth. And like maybe like a regular meeting just to say, hey, here's a problem. Johnson needs it solved. Who's going to solve it? It doesn't matter who, who takes the lead, but it just got to get, it has to get done. Should be a quarterly meeting. That's, yeah. So some, I like that. Like some, just to like push the responsibility out there to get taken, you know. <clears throat> Maybe yeah. I'm naive. <laughs> <laughs> we could do away with one of these meetings and call it a joint meeting. Good. I can <laughs> find out what their availability is. And because I've got a list for that. Could you email it to us? Tom, what, what you just said is is probably important. Um one of the concerns that I have is Randall's community economic development coordinator, which is paid for solely by the town. Um candidly, and this is probably selfish, I don't necessarily want. Randall working on projects that are going to benefit the village without any compensation for that. So if there can yeah. be some discussion about some sort of contribution on the part of the village to that yeah, I level of activity, I'm I'm open to those discussions, but I'm not open to a free pass for the village for I don't even know if they know them. that. You know, and but then they at least they have the ability to say we don't have the resources, so we want to pay for it. You know, but at least like we don't even give them the opportunity to say yes or no, you know. And I, oh, I think there's been plenty of well, opportunity. There, I think they the, know. The village trustees and the, and the village voters were very clear. They did not want merger. Right. That was, that was a clear sign to me that they don't want this kind of thing. So and I, they were given a little bit opportunity. Of what, yeah, to vote, to vote to help fund this position. Right. They said no. Yeah. So should we be having this position? work mostly in the village i don't know that's well the whole thing can come down to we can point certain things out and when we go to negotiating on certain things that we had discussed in the past that could be brought up as part of the bargaining chip i can board wants can. a joint meeting <laughs> Yeah, they don't have enough meetings. Are there Is anybody any... tracking on what I said? Yes. Can you yeah. email me that. I, I was kind of uh, cryptic about it, but we we know what I'm talking. About. Are there any further questions for Randall on his report? That was a lot, but it was a good report. Thank you. Um, I just want to point out just a couple of things real quickly. One was it's in the report, but the Vermont Department of Tourism and Marketing does have locations in Johnson included now on its map and within the descriptive text, which I was very happy about. And I am actively trying to get uh, Johnson businesses listed on their directory as well. Um, but when it comes to the bond vote, because I, I do have to go, I just wanted to point out that in the FAQ, FAQ, for the grant, it ha there's a really interesting conflict. There's two questions in the FAQ, uh, one of which is, uh, if my project is approved, can the grant agreement be signed before I have evidence of full funding for, for the project, and, you know, meaning match? And the answer to that one is yes. And of course, that must be yes, because we signed a grant agreement, right, without having the full funding secured. And then the next sentence is, a Catalyst Program grantee, which is what we are, has until September 30th of the year following award to secure all matching funds for the project. And that September 30th deadline is the sort of deadline that Pat Ripley has been emphasizing over and over for the bond vote. But I need to look into this because the following question doesn't necessarily seem to make sense with the question that I just cited. It's the, it's the exact next question in FAQ. It says, what happens if I am approved for NBRC funding but I am unable to secure matching funds. And the answer to this one is, if matching funds are not secured and document, documented within 12 months of the award date, uh, the funds may be deobligated and awarded to other things. Well, the official award date of our 
NBRC grant was August 15th. And so 12 months from August 15th, right? It's August 15th of this year. And so it's just strange that there's two questions, one following the other. One says September 30th is the deadline for a match. And then the very next question says one year from the award date. So I'm going to get clarity on that because that's obviously a very important piece of information. But like I said, Pat Ripley, who is our LDD, which is sort of our sort of administrator for this, you know, he has been saying over and over that there's a September deadline. So I'm trying to find solace in that just just for everyone's awareness. I would suggest that we go with the September 30th date <laughs> and not ask the question about August 15th at this point. Okay. I mean, I'm going to call Pat. I'm sure Pat's going to reinforce. I tried calling him today, but I, I, I was too late. I don't, I think he was out of the office. I'll discuss it with Pat and I'll, uh, I'll just, just make sure that, you know, we're all, we're, that we're operating from the same assumption, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very clearly answered in there in the question that I cited that the grantee has until September 30th of the year following to secure all matching funds. So just FYI. But that's that's it, unless anyone else has questions for me. That's All right. Further questions from Randall? With none, I'd like to thank you very much, Randall. We do have more conversations on the Jewett property coming up late in the meeting, but I don't I don't know that we need Randall for those unless the board wants to request it. All right. Thank you, Randall. Thank you. Thank you all. Next item on the agenda is town sewer water connection. Tom, would you like to do a brief synopsis? Yes. I have to say that I'm under informed with this. I don't really fully understand on the process. And I also need to say that the five we have on the server are, are defined. Um, but this was uh, designed to create sewer connections easier and to allow for development in town. Um, and this went, went back to the planning commission. Uh, they brought it forth for the board back in 2021. Uh, the board did not take action on this. Um, I believe the board was looking for um, specific locations for, for future development. And I think that's kind of where it stalled. Um, Mike brought this back to the board a month ago and the board decided to take it back up. And so that's where we are now is, is this a policy that the board is looking to approve um, or do you want to go back to the planning commission for clarification or do you want to, um, what's, what's the chicken, what's the egg? Do you want to go to the planning commission for clarification or do you want to approve it and then Ask the planning commission for direction upon approval. On location, locale. Yeah, I mean, it, a lot has changed since 2021. I mean, it's. I was going to ask if Paul yeah. was okay with giving a. I'm glad you're here, Paul. Thank you. Well, it's the only reason I'm here, but thank you. Um, planning commission felt very strongly that we didn't want to be picking winners and losers as far as property values around town. So. We may we looked at other towns, what policies there were, and tried to create a policy that you could apply if someone applies for an extension to the water or sewer lines. But we didn't want to say, okay, do cool dill or do some other section of town. So we didn't want to pick the areas to be done unless that's something you want to specifically charge us with. That was not at least I understood it, what we were asked to do. So we didn't do it. But there was a discussion we had. And several members of the planning commission at the time felt pretty strongly that it wasn't our place to say this place should be developed and that shouldn't. Well, that's where this came from. And that uh, question, Paul. Before. So basically, Paul, as I read it, this is this is just a start. So if we adopt this the way it's written, we are to work in concert with the village to define these areas, correct? Right? The way this is written is if someone buys, then all this stuff kicks in. You don't, it does not written for you to specifically designate places for development. 
Okay. Is that? But it would be probably better to do it that way than everybody would know up front. Wouldn't you think it would be really the village's purview to say we want to go through sure. our lines one way or the other? Right. But what I, I try to give Walter to come tonight because Walter spoke uh, to the select board several years ago when I was on the board about trying to get more sewer connections. All right. Uh, because they, the wastewater treatment plant had plenty of reserve capacity. And the, the more naturally, the more revenue that comes into that facility, the more money they have to do further work. And he mentioned at that meeting that he wanted to get as many people as possible to hook into it. And especially at this juncture uh, in our community, when the college is uh, kind of not as big as it was several years ago, and we're losing all of these homes in the village, we're the wastewater treatment plant is losing revenue. You know, and I'm not here to be an advocate of the village or the village wastewater treatment plant, but I look at it as economic development for the town that if we have more area that people can easily hook into the sewer, then we can have more development, more property taxes, to maybe to try to offset some of the property values that we have lost during the flood of last year. Now, I would like to adopt this the way it's written, and I would like to work with the trustees on this to come with an equitable solution, or we could leave it the way it is. And if somebody came in, then, we would have to have a meeting with the uh, village to discuss the service area. But I would like to get this started. And I'm afraid that maybe this is the first time you've seen that. Maybe. Is this the first time you've seen that? You, you've seen this from the Planning Commission? Not the new write up, but it's been many times. Okay. So, anyway, you have that in your hand. Uh, I realized that somebody come to the town two and a half, almost three years ago, and asked to hook up for a development of one single arrow, and nothing went anywhere. Right. Well, anyway, that that is the past, and I'm trying to resurrect this and to try to to move forward, uh, because we don't want people, you know, putting leach fields in somebody's backyard when we have a waste when we have a sanitary sewer which is close by to take a hook into. And it's pretty well spelled out about the uh, billing it to village specifications, and then the village takes it over. It's a boilerplate for many municipalities. It's, it's, Correct, Paul? Absolutely, a lot of copy and paste. Yeah. It seems to me that the village ought to adopt it first. Well, the town has to do this because it is an addendum to the town sewer, sewer area. So that's leading very tightly into a question that was asked last meeting and I don't think has been answered. Planning Commission proposed a policy, right? But we already have an ordinance. <clears throat> Having a policy and an ordinance doesn't make much sense. I do believe that an ordinance would supersede a policy. It does. Okay. So accepting this policy tonight, in essence, negates itself because we need to amend the ordinance. That's correct. Um, so we can start the process to amend the ordinance. Is that the wishes of the board? I guess that's like the big, big question. Um, and would we like the Planning Commission to look at the ordinance for amendments and try to tie the policy into it in a manner of speaking? And not to put you on the spot, Ken, but you have a general sense of if the village is interested in getting more sewer? So don't take any and all customers on the sewer. Or I want to say with a plus or minus supply for 45% capacity for the sewer plant, and I believe we're maybe 50% of the water. Okay. Just all right to the back. We build a new plant, it's not going to be left to that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, who I would like to also kind of make a, an apology to the Planning Commission uh, for the good work that they did, and it took so long to bring this forth. Um, it appears that they got 
lost in the shovel somewhere. Well, and, uh, as a single board member, I apologize to you for not acting on it sooner. I don't know what the rest of the board wants to do, but you have my apology. Not necessary, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the hard work you do. So, Evan, maybe not the answer. What do you see is the correct way to report? Should we wait for the village? I mean, it's nice that Ken says this, but should they have a policy that says we will take all farmers within the town of Johnson and then we adopt this and then we change our ordinance? It just seems like the cart's before the horse without knowing that the village is has a policy in place that says, yes, we want all comers. Just get it written down and get it voted down so we know they want it. Ken, Ken did raise his hand, maybe to it. We have a policy that said if we fill out a permit, I believe, I may be wrong, but I don't believe the village can produce any permit that we fill out. So maybe if they do already have the policy, it would be good to ask. Yeah, that would be Eric, no, just to know that we have a policy to take all comers to make me more comfortable. Well, speak of the comers that aren't the village, right? That's what you're talking about. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Talking, you're talking outside the village, you're saying you want the word. The village is going to put a 10 mile line up to you. I, I totally well, understand that. Okay. But, but Paul, you were not wanting to take winners and losers. I just want to make sure. The village is going to be a place to be going there for the same. Yes, we want to go in this direction, we want to go in that direction. We have capacity in that direction. I mean, I don't know how to I know nothing about the size of sewer lines, but there's got to be bigger pipes going in some directions and smaller pipes going in other directions. Can I make an observation? Yes. Um, yeah. Put me in my place. So, a, a little bit of a history lesson the, the original purpose of the town sewer service area was twofold. One, it was to provide access to water and sewer for those mobile home units in the mobile home park, which were not within the village. So understand the village has a duly adopted sewer ordinance of its own, and it's been adjudicated in court several times that the village cannot extend its sewer lines beyond its corporate limits without the addition of these town sewer service areas. So that's why these were created. Okay. This the original sewer service area down there was for the purpose of picking up the mobile home units that were not in the village. Going up a hundred C, it was that was originally the town sewer line. The village didn't own it. So the town conveyed or deeded to the village that sewer line, but the original deal with that sewer line was only those people who were out there in existing dwellings could hook into the sewer line. Uh, that guy, Levy Gray. Right, yeah. Uh, he wanted in the worst way to hook onto that line, and he couldn't do it because his building was built after that sewer line was put in. So that this town sewer line service extension up and encompassing that line that the town taxpayers paid for originally uh -huh. um, was originally that, that was designed to be able to add new people to the line, they would have to fill out the town sewer service area, and then it would be submitted to the village, and the village could approve it under their ordinance for the technical issues, the technical technical requirements, like, you know, the extension, the size of the pipes, all of that stuff. That was, that was within the village purview. But the way it's set up right now is, is it's a setback from Route 100 safe. And if you're in that setback zone, you can hook up. If you're not, you can't. Why would he he probably could have, um, but at that point in time, he had already built. he already built an in-ground system. Oh, okay. um, so I don't know whether he ever hooked up or not. I, I don't know if he's, you know, those property. Levy's not even no, around anymore, but those properties are still there. Um, 
But that's that's what we've got. We've essentially got an ordinance that controls connections within that identified town sewer service area. Should that we expand that? Seeds. What's it? That one out of hundred seeds is unique. Is what? Is unique, right? That's a specific one that the town paid for, unlike the ones to the mobile home park. Yeah, the one in the mobile home park, Harvey paid Harvey paid for the infrastructure and the village accepted it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eventually. Um, well, that's the way it will be from anybody else if they yeah. they hook into it. It could it could be my my you know to to complete my thought is that that's the basis for how those things got set up to begin with. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we extend that area or whether or not we allow additional hookups if your property touches that area or whether it's a wide open field of anybody can hook up any anywhere as long as they pay for the cost. I personally am not in favor of that, um, but I'm open to the idea of, for example, where the college is, um, talking about the possibility of the college not being here, they've got a farm property up there off of Gillen Road that could host a pretty good sized development. Should that be an area that you know we allow an expansion to? And I think that is a legitimate function for the planning commission, whether they agree it or not. There should be some indication of where you want to promote growth. It's, it's part of the municipal planning process. Doug. I'll, uh, I'll buy time for Paul. Um, I think that it was very important that you actually take responsibility for this by delegating it to the planning commission and giving them a mission to do that i think it would be absolutely irresponsible of you to rely on who wants to apply and where it's going to be as far as what would benefit this community the most my i remember walter's presentation and his example was that we would go to the waterville boundary if they would put it in uh the sewer lines and i advocated for a long time that we ought to have an expansion of of the town sewer service areas that are served that that we could bring in there are, there's plenty of land and i would suggest the the land on the left hand side of clay hill as you go up would be wonderful to be served but i think that it ought, needs to be studied in order and it not be done on a catch as catch can basis and and the town ought to have input rather than who wants it and uh who's willing to pay so who would who would who would do that analysis Doug, of where where those areas should be done <laughs> you busy paul well, you got to make it our mission i guess we will well, it took us so long to even talk about this. <laughs> Hopefully that won't get done. It'll be another three years. It seems but using Doug's using Doug's no, example. I, I'm I'm all for that. I I think we gotta do everything we can for development within this community. But uh, yeah, to a point. Um, yeah, I agree with that. But um using Doug's example, there is a current sewer line that goes up by hill and ends roughly at the village boundary. Um, there is there are no sewer lines from that point all the way down to Main Street, going all the way down to Old Hill. That's wholly within the village. All of that land is within the village. And those are all private septic. Those are all private septic. There is no sewer line up there. And that is wholly within the village jurisdiction under their sewer ordinance whether or not, you know, if somebody comes in and wants to do a subdivision up there, they can go through this village sewer ordinance and say, yes, we'll put in a line, you know, after it's been taken out, you know, after it's been engineered and taken over for a year, then the village can accept it into the village sewer system. But, but that's wholly within the village. So what you're talking about would be an extension of the town sewer service area into the town for an area where there, actually is no sewer line right now. The town would be paying for that. Well, um, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna volunteer to pay for it, but 
you know, that would be a private developer that would, if somebody wanted to develop it, the developer could make a proposal to pay for the infrastructure. Right. That can the policy very low. Right. Yeah. yeah. It feels like this is an extension of zoning. Right, like, like, yeah, like well, 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 cannot well, regulate well, wealth with sewer connections. But it very much feels like the town is dictating the future of Johnson because of the development of water and sewer. And it might be in the best interest to make the entire town a town sewer service area. So we just eliminate that whole statutorial process and Supreme Court ruling. And then like, let the village engineers do what they do and decide, hey, we can't do it or we can. And like think capitalism does what it does and they'll decide where the future of here and then you know it's, it'll be more organic rather than now it's just the five people who are here at that time who say no we're not going to do that service area that's a wonderful idea John. i agree right. ken no i mean it's all about feasibility so it's kind of like the cable system that not get cable either so if there's not enough revenue coming from a certain area, they said they're not, the village is not going to extend to that area or work with the town to extend that area to pick up one customer. You know I mean? So it's got to be just to use Sinclair Road as an example. There's several houses there that could be picked up. The houses that have conventional septic, they're small lots, probably wouldn't be allowed another conventional septic. So I think somewhere in there should be allowed if they're in them areas that they could, if they can't get another one, they should be allowed to have done. So grab that and I'll we'll vote on it. Nick, can I ask him a question? So, sure. Go for it. Ken, what if the town was all, all yours? Does it say yes, sewer can go and sewer can't go? And that decision for that piece for the, you know, the BCA, the benefit cost analysis is defined. You're going to know what that is. So X number of feet, you need X number of gallons. Like, do you think the town should have a say in that or not? At the same time, you got to look at possibilities. The village is going to look at it, your pump station. So if it's pump station, you're talking a couple million dollars in one pump station. So if it's... But, so say that they was all... five customers and have to put in two pump stations to get back to the plant, yeah. it's not feasible. And so say, but say it was all yours to make that decision and you had a development on Sinclair Road and you say, yes, we'll do it, but this is the cost. These are the specs. It has to be put in with this pump station, this volume and this line size for future development beyond you. Would, 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 but then it's your engineers doing, it, you know, and it's happening. Is that something that the village could do or want to do or want to be part of? Again, I'm only one member, but... The village's motto is that they accept any and all sewer systems that would be the belief responsible for the village to take on. I think I'm not trying to cut anybody short. We are filling up the time slot. Uh, the way I see it, uh, the most appropriate step forward would be for the select board to ask the planning commission to relook at the sewer ordinance, in the town's sewer service areas. Oh, and I mean, you might come back and say, well, the whole town, um, but we already know that's not really feasible. Um, that's what I see, because we need a town sewer service area to even make it happen. Tom's approach is clean. It's it all over with quick. It's also totally against all planning regulations and Act 250 and the Supreme Court decisions about extending sewer lines for unplanned growth. Yeah. So, so I can't Dollars support it. I cannot support it. I won't support it. But let's vote. Uh, do we want to? Do we want to open the ordinance up? There you go. Temperature of the board. Is the board willing to open the ordinance up and look at the town sewer service areas? Yes, I would be open to it. I don't know if you know. Expanding it to the whole map is feasible, but we can probably look at certain areas. I'm open to examining the ordinance. Sounds like and sending and sending it to the planning commission and say, "Look at this. Is it rational? Should it be something we change?" I don't know enough about the ordinance. Well, there's an old ordinance that's been there for 20 years. I know, and I don't know. <laughs> so, but, but all we're doing is talking about an amendment. So that sounds like the board would like it looked at. 
So I did suggest maybe the planning commission would go to meet with Eric, the village manager, and he could give you a good temperature as to what direction the village would probably be more interested in than others, I guess. That would be a really good asset in part so of the process. <clears throat> you're asking if we revisit the, the current ordinance to what end? Look at the town sewer service areas and recommend extensions of them. Right yeah, now, I think right also, now there's two, right? If it's possible to, and this is my opinion only, maybe others will agree. Um, if it's possible to incorporate this policy into the ordinance, um, I think being part of the planning commission at the time, you know, I'm a little biased, but I think we did a good job of creating, uh, you know, a clear and non biased process for people to go through that if you meet these conditions, you know, the conditions set by the village in this case, you can get connected. I think having that, as long as you are within the town sewer service areas, I think that's a good a good policy to have built into the ordinance. So uh, to that to that point, there there are a lot of things in this policy which contravene the current village sewer ordinance. So I would strongly recommend, as Ken suggests, that Eric Finley be part of that process because I I will adopt a policy or an ordinance that steps on the toes of the village in terms of their ordinance. They're, you know, they have a separate duly adopted ordinance. I don't believe that we can have a policy or an ordinance that tells the village they have to do something. No, I don't think anybody on the board is uh, trying to do that. I think we want to be equitable to both the town and the village and to people who want to possibly have a development. So, you know, cooperation is key. Liberty. And I think that uh, we should move forward as quickly as we can. And I think we have heard, I mean, at least only from Ken, but I think it, this is the sense of the, the village trustees. They do want more customers. And as long as it is feasible, you know, I, 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 this is one area I really do agree with Tom is like, if we just leave it up to the village to decide whether a project is feasible or not, and we take ourselves out of it entirely, um, you know, as long as it meets whatever standards they they have, um, maybe this needs to be changed to meet those standards. But um, yeah, please understand that if a project is subject to an Act 250 permit, and there's a, 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 a sewer line extension of a mile and a half long, I guarantee you that project is not going to be approved. I because would... they will look at that as scattered development. Um, unsupported so and, and I don't think the village would support that you know I, I think that's that's what Ken was yeah. just saying is we're not going to build it out for well then there's no point in having the entire town be a town source in this area I'm not <laughs> suggesting that. I I'm sorry if that was not clear <laughs> like I see the process of development is having like layers of red tape right one layer there's like act 250 right there's all the state potable water and wastewater then there's like hooking up the village allocation. And then there's this random town sewer service area because the Supreme Court said we need it. And it feels like that's like one thing that we could get rid of to make it easier because they still have to do, if any one of those falls apart, development can't happen. But it's like, if we could make it easier to just get through one of those layers, it might help. You know, that that's how I, that was my thought behind it. And that, that assumes that all development is good. You know, I don't know that that's a good assumption. Yeah, number one, very true. And number two, I want to really caution everybody that allocations for water and sewer cannot be used as a method to control or encourage growth. That's, you know, that's just a fact that's been adjudicated numerous times. So. Paul, are you clear on the request? We've gone a couple of circles since. Yes. And what is the water some more? Honestly, not really. Uh, with, Every time you come to said, the water and sewer policy can't be used to control growth. So, but that's exactly what you're asking us to do is extend the service areas to some portions of town but not other areas or down version of the entire So me personally, uh, if you dealt if you designate a town sewer service area. The ones that are out there that I'm that I talked about, the, the pipes are already in the ground. Okay. So those it's really a question of 
do you allow people beyond the borders of the setback, the identified area, to hook into that or not? Um, that I think is a legitimate question. But there are other areas. I mean, it's, what's that? Yeah, it's pretty limited area. There's no long bar can ever see nothing else, right? Right, but the one that Doug talked about would be an extension of the town's sewer service area beyond the village carpet lines where no infrastructure currently exists. It, it, it may well make sense to have, in my mind, that would support the idea of dense compact residential development in the village core. But running a line out Route 15 to, you know, to the Hyde Park Town line doesn't make any sense to me. Um, okay, so sort of thinking about the end, you're asking the planning commission to look at it and see where it might make sense to extend it. Yes, that's the sense that I'm getting. Yeah, yeah that's sort of going you know, growth by. How, did, how does all that comport with the the municipal plan work that you just completed? You know, does it? Because ultimately, that's it's got a whole other rabbit hole. That's well, but I think that ultimately, yeah. and you may not want to go down that rabbit hole, but I can tell you from what I have just seen coming down from the legislature, both the regions and the municipalities are going to have to do that level of planning. And, you know, we may not like it, we may not think it's prudent or good, but that's what our legislature just gave us. Um, so, you know, you might want to talk with the Lamont County Planning Commission, too, to, you know, to get some feedback from them on recent developments with Act 250 changes, et cetera. There's a whole new raft of crap coming down the road. <clears throat> Paul, you've seen the, that map up there for East Johnson, right? Pardon me? You've seen that map. It's for East Johnson for the sewer, sewer area. Oh, it's going, yeah. It's going, it's it, didn't it have like a hand drawn area where it was in? It was never really surveyed, was it? That's pretty easy. It's not right there. It's, it's yeah, right. It's in your packet. Right. right. It's, it's GIS. But, but that yeah, it was. There was a line put through one of those years ago, as I recall. Never really surveyed, surveyed. So if you, I was always on the assumption if you had, let's say, uh, two pieces of property like this, that there was a line through here, okay, you couldn't do anything with the upper property, but you could do something with the lower property. That's Drew's Fairbanks case. He's got part of his lot is in the sewer service area. And I believe he was given one permit for right. the portion of the land that's in the sewer service area. The portion he's complaining about is the part that's not in the tenant sewer. So that's area. the area up here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if he's running, he could run a line down through his own property, but that's not right. That's illegal, correct? That I think was a matter of interpretation of the ordinance and. As far as I'm concerned, if it's going through his own property, why couldn't he do it? That, that would be a relatively simple uh, adjustment that we could make to the ordinance if your property touches the town sewer service or, or ordinance area, your entire parcel is able to access, you know, water and so on. Okay. And that, that could be a simple addition or change to the ordinance that might make sense. Yeah. I think, uh, I'm gonna I think the intent of what you're saying, Duncan, is for the expansion for development. I think it's more for like us to not go to Mark and say, hey, buy the Royal County Field Days law and we'll put sewer in there to develop it. You know, I, I think that was more the intent of the law. So I mean, whether it's not it's factual or not, but that's the way I put it. And I'd just like to add that if you're going to work on extending it on someone else, I couldn't say. Well, 
We're going to get it on to the ordinance with what you have written here about having a hydraulic study and all that done. I mean, I haven't read it completely, but it kind of sounds like it would have to be done per case. That seems kind of reasonable for anybody else to do. I would suggest maybe it'd be like once a year to check for capacity and hydraulic capability versus each. There's some chairs up front, folks. We want to sit down. I do believe that we need to move on to our next item here. We are a little bit behind. We'll seems time. seems like you never got full clarity, but if you need to come back to us, please do. And thank you for all your work. We don't try to pile it on every time you come. I don't know. Because Shane busted it. Uh, the next item is discussing the ATV ordinance. I do believe there's some people from the crowd here to talk about it. Uh, Shane had requested the sheriff's department here, and he hasn't arrested me yet, so I assume he's not here for me <laughs> uh, to discuss it. I mean, obviously, we're not going to change the ordinance tonight. I think this is high-level conversation. Uh, if the board wants to change it and what the request from the club is, uh, would somebody from like the club like to come and present on what the request is? Can you, I, I have been kind of skipping it, but the little black line up there because the uh, microphone doesn't grab the full audience, I'm sorry. I'd just like to remind the board that when I asked about this five years ago, it was not the club, it was the residents. Somehow the boards got confused that the club's asking for this. The club didn't ask for this, the residents. Okay, thank you. Being that that was several boards ago, I'm not even totally sure what the request is. Uh, can that be spoken to? I mean, Certainly, if, if you'd like to speak to it, Ken. I believe it was 2019. I came to the town meeting and asked to be on the other business agenda. And I asked for permission from the town to open up Main Street, which was a close to a year long process. And we told them that. And to gain access to the village to allow the other half of the town to access the trail system or other roads. Um, we simply asked for a paved section of Clay Hill to Ghoul Hill, which Ghoul Hill is open besides the paved section. So we asked for Clay Hill paved section from the dirt to Ghoul Hill, the paved section from Ghoul Hill to 15 and Railroad Street because the state opened 15. It's still open to this day, even though the board doesn't allow us down into the village. And they said there wasn't a fair chance for anybody to talk about it or appeal it. Well, I was, that's the reason it was taken away after a complete perfect trial. The Sheriff's Department will vouch that there was no incidents during the trial period. I'm not sure if you remember that. Thank you. Um, I checked with the Sheriff's Department all the time, checked with the Harris College do it all the time. We worked very well with the town. Now we're stuck on patrolling. I mean, if there was no incidents down here in the middle of the village, if there's hardly any incidents in the city of Newport, if I can ride from the Rocky Road clear up to Enosburg, or not, sorry, Enosburg, Richford, ride the pavement all the way through to Berkshire, all the way back to Johnson, they enjoyed getting my revenue as I was there. The town spent tens of thousands of dollars to bring revenue in with the bicycles. You had revenue here and you kicked it out because of technicality. Every this last year, this board, besides Mike, he wasn't on the board, allowed the snowmobiles to use Gould Hill. They have no ordinance. I can't petition it. You're not giving it a fair opportunity. But yeah, that's standard for how many years now? Guys, just got to be fair about it. Amend the ordinance. Let them petition the amendment. If that's the case. Thank you. 
Does the board have any other questions or comments for anybody? Watson? Yeah, I mean, so I had asked for, a, you know, someone from the Sheriff's Department to be here because one of the things that I've heard uh, as a part of this ATV conversation is that um, enforcement has been sort of spotty in certain areas and that, uh, you know, some people feel like it is kind of a no man's land in, in some places where, you know, people are able to ride in places they shouldn't be. And, uh, you know, I hear from uh, the, the club a lot of time that those are not club members. Um, and I know that the Sheriff's Department has actually worked with the club on certain initiatives to work on enforcement. So I just wanted to hear what you had to say about that and whether that's a challenge. Let me just start with uh, after I got the request, I went back and I looked at uh, a year's worth of ATB complaints for all of the talents that we provide services for. We provide law enforcement services for Johnson, Hyde Park, and Wolfman. In that year's time span, there were about a dozen. And I would say four to five of those were in Johnson, and they were all a specific location except for one. <clears throat> and then the rest of them were scattered throughout Hyde Park in Wolfman. Um, Wolfman has not opened up any of their roads to eight. In regards to uh, enforcement, we have a very, very difficult time enforcing ATB problems. Number one, we just don't have the, the people power to do that. When I have one officer on a shift, unless we're right in the area where we get the complaint, that ATB is long on, and we are not going to pursue ATB. So it, it's difficult for us to enforce. Having said that, the majority of the issues that we have are not with club members. They're with folks that have chosen not to join the club because we can contact, if we, if we see an issue or have a concern, it's been very, very easy for the Sheriff's Department to contact the clubs and say, hey, we're noticing this type of behavior. And then after that, there's no issue. So do you feel like just that communication with the clubs is enough to, you know, I, I guess, is, is there a sense that the clubs are sort of dealing with the issue? The, the, cl the clubs are, are taking it upon themselves to do some, some self-enforcement to, to try and have folks follow the rules. In, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, I remember when the select board had the trial for Main Street here in Johnson, and Ken's right, we didn't have a single complaint, we didn't have a single issue during that trial period. In, um, in terms of enforcement, I have talked with the chair of the club, I, president of the club. So. And uh, there is money available through the state for patrol and enforcement. They are focusing it on areas that are open to keep residents happier. That's the general consensus I got. But we're steering the conversation towards the club again. What I heard from before when I was on the board was a resident wanted residents to be able to get across town. How's the board want to handle it? It is really just high level. We could sit here for three hours if we want, but the question is, does the board have the appetite to amend the ordinance for the roads requested? Yes. So my name is Spencer Leggett, uh, Johnson resident, also the VP of Green Mountain ATB. Um, Shen's point, you know, we had a trial period seems like it went very well we just like the opportunity to get into the village again so the paved section of Gould hill be approved uh clay hill the paved section of that so basically you have two ways to get out of town so it's not just one way i want to go up straight up Gould hill and that railroad street being open again to get to our other 
people with ATVs on the other side of the river, essentially, which I am personally one of them. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, a little bit more of the law enforcement. Um, us at Massa have been working closer with the game warden services. Um, we have uh, uh, planned uh, routes and stuff, like uh, sections of trouble sums and stuff like that. Um, we're also, we have, you know, we've been raising money for our club. You know, law enforcement's a really big thing. We're willing to spend money on law enforcement, working with the sheriff's department. They're, you know, if the trouble area comes more towards the village or something like that, willing to work with the gate wardens, you know. We just want to bring revenue back into the town. Seems like if we had a good trial and just like the opportunity again. It's basically Gould Hill, Clay Hill, and Railroad Street. So we can get down in the restaurant and all the store. It's a big thing to have a store on your map. You know, get people in here, spend the money. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. Hey, there you go. What are you, Pam, Mr. Chen? Thank you, Mr. Okay. Well, we got a letter from uh, Diane Mahoya, uh to the administrator. And she's addressing uh, this uh, discussion this evening. Hi, Tom. I'm writing to ask that the ATV discussion on tonight's meeting be about starting a committee to research the impact of ATVs on a town. I think it would that would be a good beginning for putting this topic to rest. I think it's an unusual time to have this topic brought up considering all the things that are happening in Johnson, but it is what it is. I am not available to attend tonight's meeting as we have out of town guests. Thanks for your time, Diane. Do you have something you'd like to say? I just have a question towards Mr. Watson for law enforcement. You, you represent, you talk about 14 possible calls in the county. People were in this town. Probably out of that 14 were any result that you can think of. I'm, I'm sorry. Any result, any result as for did you have contact? No. So in, in the year's time, how many automobiles do you have concerns over over a year's time? Thousands. How many did you get resolved? Most of them. Not all of them. But so, I mean, so I mean averages out of the 14 that we we see the possible problems with in the last year. I'm an odds guy. I will play the odds and I don't I don't mind the odds of 14 in a year versus thousands of vehicles having a concern to see maybe not as much about having a a committee researcher, which I don't know how that would function or how that would work. But there are many towns that have tried it and it works. Yeah, there's always concerns. There's concerns with automobiles. There's concerns with pedestrians. There's got no concern with drugs in this town and every other town in this state. I think this is a very minor issue that starting a committee <clears throat> and taking up a lot of people's time. I really don't see the necessity for it. I'm not a town resident. That's just my opinion. But thank you. Thank you. Margo? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Just yell. I'm just gonna sit and yell. Um, that's interesting that uh, with Diane's letter, I think that there was, the, with the previous board, right? There was, uh, how many of you were on the, the board right before this one? Four of us. So, um, and I understand that there are like maybe 30, 32 letters written to the board. Um, you know, maybe similar to, to Diane, but expressing various levels of uh, concern. And people had actually, I think, volunteered to be part of a, a conversation, you know, maybe a committee to really have a full discussion about this. And I think that I, what Diane's asking is that rather than, I'm not sure there's gonna be any action tonight, it, but it sounds like it's moving maybe in that way, that to, that's not gonna kind of put it, I would use it like to rest, but it's, it doesn't leave it in a good place, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, discussion and understanding and then like moving forward. 
I was looking at the, um, and I know law enforcement is tricky. I remember, you know, uh, Roger saying that like over a decade ago, that, that it's really difficult. And I think actually the last board was talking maybe a constable, like, and like, what did that look like? And then that didn't sit well, you know, so in terms of like just being able to enforce this. But I was looking at the uh, planning commission's, you know, the survey of the town and, and, and village of, of 2022, where they asked, you know, a couple of questions about like, what did they see about in terms of, um, recreation programs and facilities what did you want to see right and there was probably like 160 responses but also and i do have that but the, the this means is, is going online but there was one that i will share it's like atv use on public roads all right and um 152 respondents and 21 people or 13 percent said that there's too little atv use on the roads in johnson um 40 0.79% said just right. And then 45.39 said too much. So I'm thinking that in you know before like a, a decision is made, really looking at just not like some of the, even or hearing the voices in this room, but this was a survey that went out to the entire you know village and town of Johnson and the actions, you know, that I think really and the thinking. This needs to be taken into consideration. Thank you, Argo. Any comments from the board? Well, I'm surprised, not so much, and because I have a friend on Sinclair Road who works in the TV regularly, who was assaulted by a driver. Got the license, and I'm sure she recorded it. And I'm surprised that wasn't resolved. How do you got? How would you think that we would resolve that one? You contact that person and say, "Why you were breaking the law? Here's evidence, video of you being just need to know what to do." So here's the here's the the piece with that. Yeah. It, it's it's at this point, it's no different than a speeding ticket. It's no different than um, not stopping at a stop sign. ATV violations are civil violations. Mm -hmm. So, um, Did, so the, you contact those folks? I, I have to. I don't. I'm not aware of that specific incident. I'd have to go back and look. Yeah, it was just you know, a few a few months ago. What I would say to the enforcement piece is, um, and it, it was already mentioned, more than likely that enforcement piece is going to come from Fish and Game, uh, just like. So quite a bit of enforcement isn't done by you. Just like in the wintertime with the snowmobile trails that run through our patrol areas, we're not enforcing the snowmobile stuff. That is coming from Fish and Game. They have the capability, they have the people to actually be able to do that. We don't even have the equipment. The, the best way to do enforcement would be to put somebody on an ATV. We don't even have an ATV. I don't even have somebody to put on an ATV. No, I understand that. So uh, most of these complaints go to fishing game, not to you. No, but they would people like they, they call them <laughs> they, they they will go to us at this point mm -hmm. because what I'm speaking to is moving forward as this grows because it is growing throughout the state. More ATV, yeah. yeah. That I believe that enforcement is going to come from another agency. I think one of the big problems to to enforce ATVs is that little dinky plate. I mean, that plate is just like this. I mean, you have a hard enough time <laughs> seeing a plate, from the car, let alone an ATV plate. But that's the size of every motorcycle plate. Yeah, I understand that. I understand it. It's the same with motorcycles. You know, I mean, how many times do have we heard on the board uh, in the past when I was on before, maybe somebody complained about an ATV, and the first thing somebody said, did you get a plate? Did you get a plate? Well, good grief. How do you see that stinking plate? <laughs> you know? Well, everybody nowadays has video. I mean, I probably have half a dozen video of ATVs running all over town. But... And you can pick up the plate with that video camera. Yeah. 
scroll it bigger. But that doesn't matter, neither here nor there. I mean, I think the thing is, is that 90% of the ATV people are obeying the law. They're, they're doing a good job. It's no, so it's no different than than the public highway out here. Right. 90% 90, 90 of the people are, are doing what they're supposed to do yeah. on the road. It, it's the 10% that you've right. got to figure out what you're going to do with it. And, the, and that's important, that 10%, because the people that live on these back roads have to deal with the 10% that, you know, eight years have evolved. I mean, I will say they're a lot quieter than they were five years ago. Um, they're a lot bigger, too, but um, they have evolved. And they're, you know, we just need to figure out what kind of enforcement will work for that 10%. And maybe none of it. So what's a good word for the, the, is it a trail study route that was taken down Railroad Street and Gold Hill and stuff? Is that the proper name for that? Trial period. Trial period. I guess. I, I would I would like to amend the ATV ordinance because they, there was no problems with those trials on those areas. So we should just make it permanent. Okay. Let them drive on those roads. It's not really much to ask compared to the whole big scheme of things. Well, I think attached to that, I could be wrong, is opening up parts of clay, gold, like that that area as well. Well, that's true. That I'd part of that study area. It was to the, get into the village and to get onto railroad stream. So that's all part of it. Hang on. We got a lot of hands now. Are you good? No. Okay. So he, only because his hand was first. That's it. St. Clair Road has been open for 18 years. So, according to the ordinance, which you guys were hung up on, the paved on the lead on sections. So, if that's such technicality, you might as well throw the ordinance out because almost every road you have has a paved lead on section. So, you you sign for us to cross that whole line road and get state permit to use 100C to get the whole line road. Off the Rocky Road, there's a paid lead on. On Hawaii Road, there's a paid lead on. Come on, let's be serious here. The plates are on the ATVs so we can ride on the roads according to the state because I pay $85 a year just like for you to drive your vehicles on the road. Secondly, we're asking for small sections of pavement. Bull Hill is 95% open already on the town ordinance. And if you didn't count your lead on, it's open. So, I mean, Johnson isn't special, right? You guys preach inclusivity, all kinds of stuff. If Newport can do this, if Hyde Park can open every road, Duncan yourself said maybe we should check with other towns and see what they are because it would be a lot more cohesive if we all matched. You didn't do that. It's been four years since this conversation has happened. Let's just open the two damn whole sections of road and let's move forward. If they want to petition that, like Mike said, make an amendment, let them petition it, and we go back to the way it is. To do a study to open up 500 feet of pavement on Clay Hill after Clay Hill is open besides the paved section is kind of ridiculous. I don't agree with any studies myself. Or committees either. That's what I meant, committee, sir. Mike, do you have a motion that you would want to make? Well, uh, I, I would say, say that uh, I don't even know if we need a motion. You were just going to check with the, the board, right? I This was simply out there to get the board's wishes. Susan did have her hand up. I'd like her. I'm thoughts. just curious. Where do you go down Railroad Street? You can't have an ATV on the rail trail, can you? I. Uh, you know, I can't speak for the other people in the audience. I I get the general sense that they want the residents on that side of town would like to have access across Route 15 in general. Mm -hmm. um, and then they would have access to gas and a restaurant, post office, some other things. Yeah, I think generally that whole side of town is open to ATVs, except they can't get into the village. Right, and get onto the other side that connects the other town. I think more so shut down, right? I believe more so. so doesn't allow it. 
kids. I don't think it's really a lot to ask to, to, for a little bit of area so they can get one end or the other to get on the trails and everything else. Really. And then with, I also have this just for clarification, be able to so if you're going like across like to railroad, you, you could actually go to Jolly's or Maple Fields down 15. Okay. I, I, the state permit is a set. State permit ends in Gold Hill and ends at Maple Fields in. Okay. And any amendments to that would be through the state. Uh, so. um, Very quick. Quickly, since so we're running over. Say the board had a supported new ordinance that included rather than amending but just created a new ordinance the board could put it to a town-wide vote that would be binding and that's a way that kind of lets residents speak and if it fails it would just fall back on the other one or you could follow the amendment process which takes a petition and then that that could then go into a vote as well where are you getting the idea that you could have a town white vote on the ordinance. Uh, I reached out to the senior staff attorney at BLCT and said, if there is a town wide vote on a select board support and ordinance, is a town wide vote advisory or binding? Um, and their response, if passed, it would be legally binding uh, with the effect of negating whatever action the select board took on the ordinance. That, that I think you're misreading that. But I read that same thing and it says what he's referring to yeah. is the permissive referendum in the statute which has to take place within 44 days of the adoption say that in a different language <laughs> a permissive referendum is hey you should know this yeah. uh, a permissive referendum is when there's only one way an ordinance can be adopted he if you read his thing so like, look I, at that this is a leading question intentionally so people know what they can and can't do right so i wanted to like let the audience know like if they don't like what's going to happen or if they do like how the residents have power that, that's why i was uh, and, and i'm trying to answer the question by saying to the best of my knowledge right wrong or otherwise the statute says that a select board adopts an ordinance the citizens have a right to petition within 44 days of the adoption of that ordinance. And the question that gets asked is, is the ordinance approved or disapproved? That's it. There's no ability for you know a petition or an ordinance to go to a public vote and approved and, and accepted. And so there, that's the only way to do it. And in the part that's the risk that I think that I wanted to lead to was that if it's disapproved, then it just falls back on the existing ordinance we have today. Yeah. And so that way, by taking a risk, there's really we're, the worst case scenario is you end up where we are today. Or maybe the best case scenario. I mean, that, that's, that's not my opinion. But is there any, I think, is there any reason why, why you scoot over Gould Hill and not just go right down Clay Hill? Uh, I think they were saying it's to have. It's, yeah, I think they were saying it's to have two different paths out of town. Um, no, and if I'm not mistaken, there's yeah, already. If he's talking about pay. I just, you know, you're on pay. We're going to give you pay 300 yards of payment. Why not just let you go right down Clay Hill and go over the Maple Fields? Um, um, would you? you know, Roof at the end state, right? That's not our decision. Right. right. No, but Clay Hill is. Going right down Clay Hill is. Well, Clay Hill and the current ordinance is a class two highway. And so I mean, is, so we're is gonna allow them so on the, We're going to allow them on the Clay Hill. So, Tom, are you saying if we just, if we amend the ordinance and they get a petition against it, they can only go against the amendment, not the actual right. ordinance itself. So that's what we need to do. We need to make vote on an amendment to the ordinance uh yeah we're getting to the temperature of the board what's the temperature of the board and i also have clarity that we need amend the ordinance to amend the ordinance who wants to go next i'd support amending the ordinance okay or against it or <laughs> against it Am amending it that's just high level question i'm against it I cut you off. I was just finishing my thought. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> they went silent. <laughs> That's what you get a big bucks for. I know. I know. Your face is all right. You can let a cigarette off. I just wanna <laughs> I just wanna say that I ride the back roads a lot on my bicycle and I often come across UTVs, I guess, side by sides. Um, and I, I have to say, I would say 98% of those people are very polite uh, and courteous. And I have no, I have more issues with jumped up trucks on riding back roads than I do those ATVs. Yeah. To be absolutely <laughs> honest with you. But I don't, uh, one of the concerns that I have, honestly, is there's no enforcement. And you pretty much admitted there's no way to enforce it. So having an ordinance, whether we have the one we have right now or whether we amend it, amend it doesn't probably doesn't matter a hell of a lot. I think for from the perspective of somebody who rides an ATV, they would want the clarity to know that they're not potentially going to have any trouble if they come into an area. It, even if, yeah, there's no real way to enforce it, and as long as they can get out of town before the sheriff catches up with them, you know, I, I, I think... I would want to have clarity that I'm not breaking an ordinance. ATV people spend a lot of money. They do. I can tell you that they spend more money on their ATVs than I spend on my car. Yeah. And they do. bring a lot of money into communities. In New Hampshire, people come from miles from other states just to ride in New Hampshire because they're very welcome in New Hampshire. And so, you know, we can have some of that money ourselves in our community. Margo talked earlier about some of the letters that we had received way back when. And one of the concerns that I would probably say I would open it up to amendment. Um, and if there was, uh, this was expressed by a number of people in, the, in, the, in those letters that we got. Many people were happy with having it um, for local people to rise. But had a lot of concerns, and you know, one was one was right up on the, the intersection of Plot and Clay Hill. Cars from Essex or wherever were coming in with trailers with five or six UTVs and unloading them and riding the roads, and that was offensive to that person. Not so much that local people were riding, yeah, but that there were a, just a bunch of people coming in from elsewhere. You know, and trucking their UTVs in four, five, six at a time. Um, and that, you know, they don't like that. Um, so I, I think that's something we should at least be aware of. That's a good um, Can I say my piece here? I know I. That worked. Um, and there is none. I would. What's your answer? No. What's that? What was your answer? Yeah. Uh, I would I would reluctantly open it up, but I will tell you this: if, if we open it up, personally, I would like to see more information from the club. I know in other towns, you talk about other towns. I know in some other towns, the clubs have specifically said we want to target these areas, and these areas we don't want to be on. They already did. They already we, let, let's let the board yeah can we yeah, can we, we let the board get through point, our yeah. discussion first and then we will open it back up to the public what i would like is to get some clarity from the club in an email uh that that they have a commitment to do enforcement um i don't think that's that hard and it does seem like the board has the temperature to amend the ordinance that's what we needed out of tonight's meeting i do hear everybody and we could sit here for three hours again uh, margo made some good points uh, you're referencing the letters in the negative there is several emails in the positive as well it is upsetting to me that only 150 people out of 3,000 residents filled that survey yeah. that, I get it. Uh, mr no, you asked like... for the temperature of the board and we don't and several of us have given it but two really have so i want to hear your temperature and i want to hear your temperature. Stuff. I just said no, that no, I can. So you said, said okay. I said I would reluctantly be willing to. Look okay. At now what's yours? I'm willing to amend the ordinance. Okay. That's all I want. 
Do we need it? Can it be wrapped up in an email? No, nope. this one's pretty important. May okay. 4th, Vermont Fish and Game. June 6th, Vermont Fish and Game. June 4th, uh, Marshall Police Department. July 6th, Marshall Police Department. July 6th, Marshall Police Department. July 7th, Marshall Police Department. We have a schedule for August 5th, uh, Vermont Fish and Game in two locations. We have a schedule for September, Marshall Police Department. Three different locations. In Johnson. All of the above terrain. So it'd be Hyde Park and Johnson and East. Now, again, I just wanted to add really quick. Since there's no enforcement, there is enforcement. You don't see a Wild County Sheriff all the time when you're driving around the roads, but you know there's enforcement. We're asking for small pavement sections. Play Hill is open. We're asking for about 500 feet of pavement. Well, the hill is open. We're asking for about a thousand feet of pavement, I'd say. So let's just be realistic. We're not asking for a law for an event. In reference to Ken's comments, um, the board would need to support this. I would like an actual legal opinion on our current ordinance. Uh, what Ken keeps referencing is our ordinance is open to all class four roads. I think that's required by state, anyways. And then non class, non paved class three highways. I have read that as a paved class three highway, not a paved road segment. The only class three highways I know that are fully paved in the town are School Street and River Road East. Is it East? Yes, that's East. Those are paved class three highways. So you're saying. I would like a I would like a legal opinion yeah. on if an apron is a paved highway or if a paved highway is a paved highway, and that's just for clarity. But the board needs to approve that. Or you're saying that as long as a part of a class three road is unpaved, that would be considered a non-paved. It's not a fully paved town. Okay. Highway. Yeah. Well, then yeah. Like our our road map has paved and unpaved segments, but the current ordinance is not written written Based in the segments, segment, right? So maybe worth asking the question. Are, are you asking for railroad speed too? Yeah. Okay. Railroad so railroad. yeah, it's, it's no. So it's those two pieces it's, of pavement plus all of those. Yeah. Okay. But the current ordinance, and I, I will freely admit that the way the current ordinance is written is probably not very good. There was a committee back in the day, and the then select board ignored the results of the committee report. Um, and honestly, one select board member drafted uh, an ordinance which got adopted. And that ordinance was class two highways and unpaved um, yeah. or, or paved class three highways were exact thing you couldn't ride on. Now, that's there's really no basis for that that right. concept, right? You know, it's just. Blaine came up with an idea, and that's what got passed. Just the concept that was there. Um, I'm not, I don't know. Susan, would you like to speak? I'll, I'll allow you to be the last one. I would point out that Morrisville uh, voted to close everything to AP leaves because of the influx from every place. They had, they had people from all over the place, and the residents, uh, friends and I were involved with this. So I know the residents did not care how much money they were dropping. They cared that they couldn't be out their yards in the summertime. They could not the windows. The noise was incredible. And I think as far as survey Marco's talking about, great many people in this town enjoy their peace of quiet out here. And they just don't want them to talk about it. And I'm not saying APD should not be allowed to have one myself. Um, can't find parts to write it. I would not want to shut them off. But uh, just to just run around on the streets to make noise, nobody wants that. If there's nobody riding around the streets, just riding right. on the streets, they're going to a destination to either get fuel, food, and get back out on the trail. Secondly, Morrisville had a quarter mile of road open and have the dead. Eight. Eight miles. Thank, thank you, Susan. Um, do we need anything further on this topic? I think 
we have the wishes. Thank everybody for coming input and I'm sure we'll see you all several more times this summer. Except for maybe Watson, which I don't know if this goes on public record, but Watson mentioned like the bad 10%. He also mentioned that people don't stop at stop signs. He pulled me over when I was 16 because I didn't stop at stop signs. I don't know if he did that on purpose, but it's on record, you know. It, <laughs> On your permanent record. I think it was a message towards me, and I don't really know what it was. I have no clear recollection of that. I do. You bet a lot of people. <laughs> He's still a lot of here. people since he was Spoke, 16. Spoken like a true officer. <laughs> well, I don't like to know he owes me money. So. No. <laughs> clarify that. Okay. So we're not going to do a thing, Mr. Chairman, do you hear from the attorney? Is that what the deal is? Uh, I would just like, you know, BLCT to kind of review it and have yeah. more of a legal opinion sense. If we open it up to amend, I think we could, can you change language? You know, I you can amend the ordinance however you want. Yeah, I think it's, I think it, we, there can be a lot of good coming from just clarifying. Okay. So are you voting or not voting? I, I started this out by saying, I just wanted the temperature of the board. That's what we got. The yeah. board is comfortable with opening it up and amending the ordinance. We don't need a motion to, start the process of amending we would need to look at the ordinance make amendments we'll need to motion to adopt it there's an adoption process of 45 days and hearings there's a process there's, a, there's a public hearing process prior to being adopted and then there's a 40 there's a 44 day day period 45 day period maybe um before it goes into effect and within that time as Ken pointed out, a petition of at least 5% of the voters could be raised and there would be a public vote on it. And that vote would be binding. And that that is really confusing because it's you either approve the ordinance or disapprove the ordinance. And it's 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 always been messy. It's all about process. I mean, it, it has to be one of integrity. And my concern is that there have been a lot of letters, a lot of voices, a lot of offers, and it's just, I feel it's a little bit like blame pulling. I think it's really safe option. to say that if we do amend this, 50% of the people are going to be opposed to it, and 50% of the people are going to say it's the best thing than slice, slice bread. And that's how it goes. That's that's the process. That's that's my guess. Yeah. Well, that's democracy. That's why we yeah. get paid the big bucks. <laughs> I had a town meeting when I asked this. It was unanimous. You were there. When you All right. Um, I'm sorry, Margo. I hear you, and uh, we we will have more. Uh, we do need to move on to the gravel pit. I have. Thank you. Very I much. have given. 40 minutes to this. Yeah. I wanted to make sure everybody could talk. Five years keep... <laughs> All right, Tom, uh, gravel pit options. I believe this is a generalized open discussion. Very clear. Sling it. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. See you later. Is, uh, everybody's last interest the direction of the yeah. board, what does the board want Jason and I to look into? Do you want to look into purchasing more land adjacent to our current gravel pit? Do you want to look into purchasing land elsewhere? Do you want to look into just buying gravel only and decommissioning when ours is when ours is exhausted? Uh, I'll go first. That way there's no secrets. I, I would like to look at purchasing more land for gravel extraction. Adjacent or all land? Uh, uh, what's most cost effective? Good answer. I'm with Evan. Whatever's most cost effective. I mean, I I think that would probably be adjacent land, but you know. Do we ever get a price? No, it's just but if you're gonna start talking to neighbors, you don't want to start talking about buying land before the board says I understand, but we were talking to an individual many years ago and did we ever get a price from it? That's way before I, I know. I don't believe we did, and we actually did some test bits. Right? Oh yeah, we spent a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. So there there should be some data out there including test bits on for what the adjacent property i'll send it to the board tomorrow if you want okay thanks 
And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm totally supportive of the idea of trying to do that, but if there were some way to get some analysis of what our ultimate end cost is going to be, including the cost of purchase, uh, developing it, um, trucking, selling, it, trucking, crushing, all of that stuff. Yes. I, I, if there's some way we can come up with a mine safety comparison, uh, it's a headache. Yeah, I, I I started to cut you off. I'm doing bad tonight. Um, I I like the idea of all comparisons. I do think the current deal is not a bad one. Current. I, I understand that we're trading twice the material that we get but we don't have any expense or headache really it's comparatively time and budgeted get the tool. it's no new expense yeah another another possibility is there are at least two other communities that own and operate their own gravel pits is there any opportunity for us to purchase gravel from them at a reduced price Yep. Really good you know, question. Over, you know, it might be another cooperative agreement there. Yep. One you know. thing that's really cool about Percy, the person we're working with now, is for, if we pull bank run and screen it, you're running round stone on your roads and it, it goes away. Whereas right now, we're taking material, crushing it, and we're running square stone that's and been packs. processed. You're right. So just, you know, just as we move forward with this, we want to make sure that we factor. It's shown that round stone does not hold on your roads and round stone, round sand goes away too. So we should be doing all of our comparisons on processed stones if we want to build up our roads for longevity. I agree completely. I, you know, if if we get to a point where we actually purchase our own gravel pit, I personally would strongly want to see a crusher come in even every few years and crush a bunch of you know, crusher on gravel it, that we could use. It might even and that cost looking, looking at ledge that. and have it in the cost of having McCullough come in to blast and crush and then walk away. So Misha's not needed. I'm sure it's not needed, but nothing. Because having having ledge is just as valuable as having a gravel bit if, if we're going to have a crusher come in. Any other board members have thoughts? Whatever is most cost effective and the best for our role. Mike's all for saving money. Who guessed? <laughs> Mike, I'm 100% with you. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> we might have a unanimous vote on that. Yeah. Um, anything further on the gravel? I guess there's direction from the board that we're interested. It's all in reading. And Getting a good product and saving money. Can you communicate? I mean, I think you were the one that was yep. mostly communicating with Bert. Yep. Mm -hmm. We can talk tomorrow. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Next item on the list is the purchasing policy. If you guys have a graph in front of you. I was having trouble delineating uh, Lois. I believe you were the one that mentioned it. And Rosemary was here about a process for um, reimbursement. Reimbursement from committees. Which section is that in? If you go down, I believe it's under. Uh, yeah, it just got cut off. So it's a three. It says reimbursement for purchases. Three F. Um, it's on page three of the packet. It says authorized persons are encouraged to use existing vendors and plan all purchases to prevent the need for reimbursement. However, in the event of reimbursement, authorized persons may make purchases and request reimbursement. These reimbursements will be made to the amount of the item only and shall not include sales tax. A purchase shall purchase order shall be filled out with the receipt and signed off by the town treasurer or town administrator. There's no guarantee items will be reimbursed. Volunteers may make purchases for reimbursement with the approval of their authorized person. That authorized person is responsible for the associated purchase order. Okay. That's seen. Put that one to bed for me. Happy with that? No, I haven't read it. I, haven't seen it. I just wrote it this afternoon. 
<laughs> would you like that? Would you like to see it? So, Sue and I actually had a discussion down at the Arboretum a while ago. And one of her concerns was, and, and I figured there must be a way to deal with this. But one of her concerns is she goes to a, a nursery and doesn't always know in advance what she's going to buy. So items on the purchase order with dollar amount yeah. may not coincide with what she actually ends up picking up. Yet the ones she's dealing with don't even accept coupons. So she has to pay for it before she can walk out. You know, is there some way we can figure out how yeah. to so make her whole on that? This is what I was imagining, right? It's a purchase order. It's really about having two sets of eyes, right? And say Sue says, hey, Tom, I'm going to go to this nursery. I could call the nursery ahead of time and say, hey, will you invoice the town of Thetum, or sorry, town of Johnson, and then we'll pay you at a next AP process. That's, that takes your reimbursement right off the page just by that one phone call to set up an account, get the S3 in place, so it's stack exempt. You just show up, get whatever you want up to your budget amount, and then go home. That would be the ideal because then you have an invoice, you have received the product, the service before you paid for it, and it checks all the boxes for, for preventing fraud, right? The other option is you're at the, you're at the nursery, you call me up and you say, this is what I need. I check the budget. Yeah, you're in it. Send me a text message. I send you back, okay to buy. You print off your text message, my text message, that goes with the PO after the fact. You know, so then it's in real time. And the other option, the last one is you just buy it and hope. Um, so you like that purchase order, I think could be flexible and flowing, like through an email or a real-time text message. So there's like documented, okay to buy by that second set of eyes that's kind of what i was imagining like so it's her scenario if i correct me if i'm wrong so is many of the people you deal with don't even have customer accounts no um also so, your second option doesn't always work because i'm uh, dealing with the call of rosemary if it's on a weekday, June 8th, 4 or 5, <laughs> and it's on a Saturday, I mean, I can, you know, get a cancellation on a Saturday and say, I'm going down to Rockdale with a tree, and all I can do is write a check, which I've done for years. <laughs> so, I how, if it was planned, and you called before you left, and you talk to Rosemary or you talk to me on my cell phone and you just say, I'm going down here and I'm going to say, hey, can I have their phone number? And, you know, this process has worked with people who are just, you know, they only take cash. But what they do accept is, they, is they'll say, yeah, we'll take a check in two weeks. Sure, yeah, like we'll take a check in two weeks. We'll send her back with a handwritten note. And then now you have two sets of eyes, your eyes, my eyes. You have a handwritten receipt. You have text message communication verifying the approval, and so you can still work it without a without a proper invoicing system. But it just takes a little bit more organization of just like, hey, that phone call ahead of time, and then we still save on the, the sales tax, and or also save due to liability the sales tax, and it still makes sure the process works. I mean, you just have to trust that. Rosemary or I will reach out and, and contact them before you get there. And then they'll dictate the process, you know, whether they'll work or not. I'm not trying to make trouble. What if you don't? What if somebody doesn't reach them? Then what, I, what if it's a Sunday and I get down there and it's like, never heard from anybody? I mean, in that yeah. case. I mean, that's part of the planning where you know you're going down there that weekend. And you call on a Friday, and I say, "Hey, never got a hold of you." Uh, you can go down, but there's, you know, you might be on the hook for sales tax, or you might maybe it's best to wait till we communicate. And it's it's not that, but it's better than what we have now, right? And sometimes making it perfect might be impossible, but trying to make it work right now, you know, this is better than what you have now. It's a little more communication, it's a little more documentation, 
but we'll never have the problem that we had a few years ago uh, that led to the situation. I understand that, but I guess what I find sad is that multitudes of volunteers over the years road check got reimbursed. They didn't waste their time. They were honest. And one guy pulled it. And all of a sudden, the whole world changed. <laughs> Um, okay, that's fine. Um, what's happened to me a couple of times has been I'm at a nursery that's an hour and three quarters away, and then I have to make a trip back there in order to finish out because, in one case, there was a line I got to the checkout at three minutes past four, and nobody answers the phone. It's a real pain in the butt. So, yeah, that's better than what we've got. You're right. I think, I think just letting I think calling the office on Wednesday or instead, you know, or like, you know, I think that planning, the point of this is that these purchases are intent. They're made with, you're making, you have, you have a positive intent. We need this and we can't wait for the town's process to catch up. So, but you know that you need it before Sunday and just, you know, just making that phone call or ahead of time, it just get it, get it done. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I guess my question is if it's involving. I'm self-employed. I don't know today what I'm gonna have to do in two days. That's always the way it is. What do you guys think? Like what are some solutions around that? Do you think it needs to be this tight or do you think it could loosen up? Well, I, I think it's fine. I think one thing that might help would be if you guys could communicate and you know, Tom could reach out to some of those entities and see if they would accept a PO in lieu of, you know, with a, I mean, a PO is a guarantee for paying. I mean, it's it's a commitment on the part of the town that they're going to pay that invoice yeah. if it's approved. So, yeah. you know, maybe some of that can be dealt with. Yeah. I'll email by just dealing with all the vendors. Yeah. If you just emailed name to contact now, those phone calls could be made this week. So that way, when you show up in two months, there's already a communication and system in place. That works. So we have to have a dumb one to the and then we have to go shopping. And Rosemary can certainly issue, you know, single use tax exempt certificates yeah. so that they don't have to pay the tax exempt. You know, those, those forms are yeah, the S3 are pretty, pretty easy to fill out. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure, I think she has them already filled out. All she has to do is sign it. Yeah. 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 And that even if you did have to pay, you know, with your own check, at least you wouldn't have to pay the sales tax and you could be reimbursed by the town for, you know, your out of pocket expenses. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I think Lois has your hand up. Yes, Lois. Was there a third option? What was the third option that you said about? I can't find it. It's just the first is using an existing account, creating an account. Right. Which the second would be using communication. You know, we have email, we have cell phones to text, just getting written approval before you do it. And then you'll unfortunately be on the hook for sales tax. Um, and then the third option is you just take the risk and do it. Um, and you, and that's uh, but it's clear in the policy that it's not guaranteed. So if you're going to try to get reimbursed for like uh, something ridiculous for the arena, it might not happen. You mean we can't go to Bermuda? <laughs> you exactly. can. Well, I mean, is there a really nice tree down there? Or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, just, I'm looking for the clarification because. Um, I'm, a, I'm a volunteer and I tend to be an elderly volunteer who doesn't text, so I can't follow those first two kinds of things. I've never had any problem with buying things, paying a sales tax myself, and processing it. And I want to, I'm hoping that option is still available. Of course, of course. I think it is. And, and additionally, Lois, I, I, the, there is a, what's referred to as a single use sales tax form. You could even, maybe Rosemary could even give them, 
for a couple of events that you know could be used. I'm even imagining that some of the committees at the beginning of the year could say, hey, these are a list of our items that we need periodically. Can you just approve the purchase of X items? So if, if you get a random receipt for something that's already an item that's already known about, I think the fear is like, oh, you're getting a palm tree and it's like, well, why are you getting a palm tree for the arboretum, right? But if you're getting like, an, like, hey, we have a plan to plant 10 trees and all of a sudden a receipt shows up for 10 trees, it matches that that email from January, right? Does that does that make sense? It's like, it's, it's yeah, a good- that's what you mean by this. I, I don't well, know. you said you take the risk. The third option was you. Yeah, you take the well, this would risk. this would eliminate that risk. Like just trying to create that would that would be a, for the board seizure list. They've already seen the plan. Uh -huh. <laughs> Is that the third time change? Yeah. Nope, that's the end of our meeting. Yeah, that's right. I agree yeah. with you. It's close. What are the board's wishes? I would entertain a motion to approve or amend it. I make a motion to approve the. Document that was in our packet. Exactly. I mean, okay. How many times are we going to go over this? Is that a second? Yes. Motion and second. Further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And the ayes have it. Thank you, Matt. Do you want to send around a copy to sign, Tom? Yes, I will have to. This is still in draft form. Yeah. Remove it, print it, and I'll have it downstairs okay. before you go home. Okay. Next item uh, is the town website RFP. Are there any angst, questions, or concerns about that? I did speak to the village. Uh, they said they wanted to see the response for the RFP before they would consider uh, going in together or not. Website is really right that much. Yeah, I spoke to um, one vendor, um, a web design company, and they, they because we're already using WordPress, which is widely used, that it's really more of a reorganization and a rebranding. And so that all the work's already been done by the previous person, you're just kind of shifting it around and organizing. Well, I, I don't want it organized like the, the current format we have. Yeah, like I said the other day, you know, look at uh, Wilkins right now. I think it's far nicer than Johnson's. I think once this comes back, I had this. I was hoping to come to the board with their requests and have each of you guys just say, "Hey, I want the website to look like this," or give examples from other towns to say, "Hey, Wolcott does this for their minutes. I want, I want that," and then compile all those ideas and give it to the award and the, the winning. Cambridge has a nice one too. Yeah. And what, you know, what has happened in the past when I've been a part of things like this is usually they'll come back with a few different options of what it could look like. And then we get to say, you know, this one looks best to us. Here's how we would fine tune it. Um, so, I, you know, and, and a lot of this, yeah, and I think I think once we get a vendor, um, it's going to be very easy for us to get something together. All right. Do you need a motion to post this, Tom? Oh, you can I'll just put that. I can just do it. Okay. Uh town logo, I think, with how far we're running behind in the additions. Maybe we talk about that a little bit more at a future meeting with the boards. And Adrian, we all get the uh the six ones that we spoke to. Pick one herself, or who's going to go out there? I'm I'm going to have to ask Beth because I think she did a little survey monkey. I think she did. Uh, yeah, forever ago. Yeah, I remember. For sure. It'd be a good one to have at the primary. The voters to vote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I think how long it take to count that one. Generalized question. Uh, <laughs> I would be sick for that. Uh, generalized question to the board. Uh, is the board interested in purchasing or leasing trucks? And this is really just uh, for our next truck to give Jason and Tom some uh, directive on what the board's wishes are. I just want to lease them. So. All right. We have one board member in support of leasing. Any further discussion? I am not in favor of leasing them. Okay. 
I don't know enough about it yet to know whether I want to link some purchase. Yeah, yeah, that's where I'm at. Can you, I mean, can you say why you're not in favor of leasing? Cost. You don't get the spec that you want. You get a generic boilerplate vehicle that they lease to anybody. And the guys down there spec the truck's heavy. A lot of other stuff, but we end up getting all of that back in resale anyways. And it, it guarantees every future board to a guaranteed payment. Period. I mean, since I've been on the board, we have replaced the equipment with the exception of the back goal last conversation with Jason on time. And we budget for that. And I have a rework of the capital equipment budget for the previous select board, but I'm waiting for the rest of the purchase prices from Jason. It just lines you up for a guaranteed payment that really I don't think pays off in the long run. I spoke to the salesman today from International, who International has a state contract, so International has been traditionally the lowest, most affordable truck. All of our trucks now are International. And so he's going to put together, he's, the earliest he could do it was Thursday, Friday, but he's going to put together a six year to own what it would cost to own a truck over six years, what it would cost to own, lease a truck over six years. And then uh, when you lease, you have like a guaranteed buyback. So at the end of that term, there's like a guaranteed price that you'll get. Or at the own, he's also going to give me like a trade-in price. So you own it and then what's the trade-in it is. Um, and then he's also going to put together a four-year plan where we have four trucks. Like right, four trucks is tricky. Um, where if you have three trucks, you can do two, four, six is great. But when you have four trucks, how do you factor in that fourth truck into a cycle? And that's something that um, is, is hard because the, the trade in value plummets around year five to year seven. Year five is like optimal and year seven is okay, right? What he said is uh, towns neighboring us, he would not take a seven year truck from Johnson. He would, that he does like our guys take really good care of it. So it's okay. So we could look at maybe doing like an eight year cycle. So you buy it out over six, own it for two with no payments. So that way you're really only paying. Or on an eight year cycle, buying it out in five right now. Correct. If we go to six, we need to go to the voters every time. Um, there's ways around that. You can buy, but well, by leasing. There's no point in being shifty with the voters. So I'll just be honest with them out front. Part of the budget, but regardless, you know, that's a moot point for, for this comp right now. Lease purchases do not consider a loan under your church. I, yeah, you could lease it for three years and buy it over the next three, so that way you don't have to go to the voters. Well, lease, lease it for all three, and then at the end, you have a price to pay. Or what, but like, Mr. Chairman, I don't think anybody's going to find their hand. I think we're trying to figure out a way to save as much money as possible. And uh, sometimes the lease, uh, you know, with your maintenance and everything else, you don't have to pay for that. It's all it factored in with the lease. Uh, we ought to look into these leases like I'm yeah. talking about, then make a decision. I don't think there's anything underhanded about this at all. And the last option is a four-year lease, so every year get a new truck. And it's, it's just putting the prices out there because a lot of them are going to be no, it's not what you want to do, but it makes the yes a lot easier. And that's kind of the goal of this information. Um, and I think we, the biggest hiccup everywhere right now, this is not Johnson, this is the entire state of Vermont, is International is putting their HV series, they stopped building them, they ran out of them. We use an HX, uh, they're not, we have plenty of those, they are changing the hood and the engine, so there's gonna be some interesting changes. But that difference, means that, that there are towns that are waiting a long time for build dates. And then you wait for the chassis, and that's when you order the body, and that's also a long time. And so getting on a plan where we're ordering the trucks two years ahead of when we need it, instead of saying, oh, it's time to replace this truck at year eight, the boards really need to get on at year six. We need to order that truck to be ready at year eight. You know, so it's like, Part of this is like we need to match the current state the environment of trucks aren't ready in six months anymore they're ready closer to two years so that's 
that's really the driving force behind any change, really. To your point, Evan, I I totally agree that our guys tend to spec the trucks a bit heavier. Um, we pay more. We pay. More. We get more. We pay. More. Yeah, and so to to that extent, if you're going to compare the lease purchase to the purchase, we ought to compare. Like that, we ought to compare what what they're offering for lease purchase, even though it's a lesser truck than what we're advertising. And the other comment I have is we used to run all internationals because candidly, the guys used to do more work on it. Now all they really do is oil changes. They don't even do brake changes. Yeah, right. the the whole maintenance being they don't even do oil changes. Part of it. I, I, out, yeah. It? Yeah. I mean there's very little so my point they is they get the extended warranty for seven years and and that it's one year of not coverage on an eight-year rotation. That's right, and that's we need to include the cost of that extended warranty yeah. in the purchase, you know, in the yeah. purchase option because those things have gotten really expensive. And my other point is, we've always maintained the same truck line. A lot of it because you know the the feedback I used to get was, oh, we we can stock one oil filter, and we can stock one this or one that. You know, uh, yeah. that's not true anymore. There's yeah. no reason why we couldn't go for, you know, competitive bid for Lodestar or Western Star or any. Eden just bought a Western Star. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason that we couldn't look at those options as, as well. Yeah. yeah. I think once we figure out a model. Just funny, right, Mike? You better believe it. Your, your, uh, <laughs> your oil changes, do they have to truck them all the way down there for an oil change? Does yeah, somebody think... come here and do it? They go to, uh, is it Jericho? Yeah, they got to drive a truck all the way to Jericho just to get an oil change on it. Yeah, they try to time it. I think, I know they do it with inspections and they do it, I think, that, I think it's, I want to say it's only twice a year and I think they time it with some other maintenance. Uh, but well, I point, certainly hope they don't drive it all the way down there just to yeah. change the stupid oil. Yeah. I mean, it's just what because we're running so far behind. Would you like numbers? It sounds like the board is yes. interested in numbers. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. That, like that's all. Yes. That's all comes after apples to apples. Everything included. I agree with that. So, and the other piece that I think is really important is Evan. You were you were working with Jason on the overall capital plan. I think if if this is going to be part of that, then. You know, we need to incorporate if I actually got yeah, if I got prices, I could do it quickly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. You have clear direction, Tom, right? All You're right. good. All right. The next item is road reclassification. To make this one really quick, uh, what is the board's feelings on starting the process of road reclassification, which is not a tiny process? Uh Jump in if I'm wrong here. Um, I do believe Town Highway 47 and Town Highway 12 are a, a lot of topic to be reclassified as a legal trail. And I do believe that those were part of the list from LCPC or no, uh, Johnson Planning yeah. Commission. Uh, but we could ask Paul, it, didn't he send you the list of? I know I've seen a list that yeah. the planning commission came up with for reclassifying. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna be able to tackle the whole list. But and it, it was some... a mixture of recommendations. Some of them right. were reclassifications trails. Some of there was one at least that we re recommended improving a road to bring up. The, I think class yeah. two. So there's uh, some major ones that I think that and some changes. That I think I really want to bring to the board's attention. One, there's like a class four road that has a bridge on it that's out. And if that ever like it's reservoir road. And it's time, there's like those are the ones that are an enormous liability that if we're on the hook to fix, right? Really, uh, I'm really sorry by hearing people, the noise is too much. Oh okay. sorry. And and then the other piece is our equipment is bigger than when the roads were built. <clears throat> and there's 
got to be a conversation. There's no guarantee what truck is going to plow a road in. And at the end of some of these roads that are smaller, um, there needs to be a discussion about how are we going to put in turnarounds, um, working with landowners to, to make sure that the bigger equipment can do the whole route. Um, and that's most of the problems, guys, getting stuck in the winter happens on our smallest roads. Um, and are just, these these single family driveways that we take care of? I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, we ought to look into that. Or the or dead end road, whether it's single family or not. not what, what road, road in particular? All right. Call, like just we we could start on two. Back. <laughs> we could start on two Absolutely. really easy, obvious ones if the board wants. I totally here, support here, the idea. Here. We have to do it. The Planning Commission had a recommendation with a list that I don't have fully in my head. I no absolutely list. think we should do it and start the process. And it's a fairly long list. And just so everybody knows, according to statute, we have to make a site visit and there has to be a public hearing. And all of the people on that road have to be notified. Yep. Uh, of the public hearing, so it's mm -hmm. it's not going to be a simple process. Right, Two right. hearings, so this, the hearing on site, or hearing later. Yeah, the two that I selected are pretty easy. <laughs> um, but yes, I mean, I think I think that area we got some being developed most is high now. Holy cow! And like maybe it's time to like reclassify that to a three, right? Because now that it has a tax now, base to support it. That would be a large yeah. lift. Or, Will there be a public hearing on this or something? <laughs> <laughs> right over Belvedere Mountain and you know. There you go. I like it. <clears throat> Asphalt. That was sarcasm for the record. All right. <laughs> I guess. Start the process, Tom, but maybe by starting the process at our next planning meeting, we could have that list from the planning commission and decide which roads we want to do. And, and I think it would be important to have Jason and Tom maybe have a third column or second column. Yeah. You know what their recommendations might be. They they might differ from what the planning commission came okay. up with. We're talking all about class or being lowered to trail, but I know there's two roads that could potentially be upgraded to a class two. I think there's, you know, the other end of Sinclair Road, in my mind, potentially should go to a class three up to the last house. Well, the last house is on the Hyde Park line. Uh, not that one. <laughs> I'm talking about the other road. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about... Um, Straight. Yeah. yeah, up to the top of the hill, basically, where uh, we get them in Woman's Tank. Oh, you're, you're not. Uh, but when you go out of Sinclair Road, it gives the teeth, it goes toward the bridge, then it goes straight, and it goes right up the hill. Yeah. You're talking about going straight? straight. Yeah. Yeah, okay. up to the top of the hill. It's not quite a Because that's hill. all Sinclair all the way up. It is. To the Hyde Park line. Well, no, it's actually, at some point, it becomes East John. Well, yeah. on the Hyde Park side, it's East Johnson. East Johnson. Johnson. But you're talking on the other side. I'm talking on, yeah, I'm talking on. on our side. You turn right yeah. at St. Clair, going up 100 C, and you just keep going straight. Straight, 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 straight on to the top of the hill. Through Rocky Road, yeah. just continue on. Yeah. Okay, I could. I can't That's what I said. I'm going to close up at the end of that road. But I thought the other road across the St. Clair Bridge. The class four road segments yeah. are affecting our score. You mean 100 lane? So, I can just type there. Yeah, let's take a look at it. Fair enough. Yeah. Let's get the list. Got thing on the side for you and Jason. Okay. Duncan. Bond and warning for Jewett property and, uh, and assessor update. Okay, so I'll do the assessor update really quickly because that's going to be real easy. Yeah. I was hoping to... I have completed the offer of employment letter. You guys authorized Tom and I to deal with that. So he and I are going to deal with it. Um, but there is a minor update that needs to be made to the level one assessor job description. 
I can't find anybody that's got an original signed copy of the original job description. So Tom's going to really? take a look. Um, I, I texted Beth earlier in the day and she never got back to me. Bottom line is, as soon as we get it done, I would like to make those amendments and get it to you guys um, and have that minor modification done to the job description. But right. I was hoping to have that for tonight, but... There's no way that we can have listers back again, probably. But what what's the total cost that we're paying for the assessor? To approve it two meetings ago. No, but I just need a refresher right now. I don't remember off the top of my head. I want to say twenty thousand a year or so. Less than two, it was twenty five, but it dropped to twenty some twenty two million. Twenty one thousand. Yeah. Ish. And the but only, that's only one day a week. That's eight hours a week. Yep. Yeah, one day a week. Uh, by, in answer to your question, like the town, I don't know how many years ago, ten or more years ago, actually voted to a bit to disband the office of listers. So step one would be having an if anybody wanted to do that would be to go to the voters and ask them to reestablish. The point system. is if we if we had our own listers and we had some people that were really on the ball, and especially in this day and age with so much stuff on the computer, we wouldn't be down the road to 2028 or further for another townwide reassessment. Why? So, why, that, why would I make any difference? Because 2028, that's a long ways away. No, I understand that, but why would it, why would having listers prevent the need for a town wide reappraisal? No, no, they could do it sooner. An assessor. They could do it sooner. The listers could. Sure they could. You're thinking the listers are do, going to do appraisal, town wide appraisal? Yeah. Oh, no, they make there. adjustments on additions. Yeah, right. Well, well at least different. if you had at least if you had listings, they would be on top of things a whole lot better than we have somebody eight hours a week. But then we still have to hire an appraisal doctor. Am I yeah. correct? Yeah. We did this in model in Pichum where the consultant for the reappraisal was only twenty thousand dollars. And then the town listers did all the labor and the consultant just reviewed. The, the labor, so you weren't paying high dollars in the field. A lot of it is like a lot of measuring and a lot of like kind of grunt field work. And that did save a lot of money. And the total cost of the appraisal, I think, was 76000 for 700 parcels, which is right on par with $100 a parcel. Um, I don't know what, what, what an appraiser, I think we'll get the RFP back. And I think that'll give you your answer. If the RFP is a hundred dollars in a for appraisal, then it might not make a difference. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I think I think getting that RFP back is really going to define how how well you what where your savings is going to be. Um, if they're more than a hundred dollars, then it's probably might be worth looking at it for local listers. If it's less than a hundred dollars, maybe best to go with somebody who knows how who's faster. You know, I don't know. Well, I think one of the big problems with the town of Johnson with their, with their listers was that the town was too cheap and didn't pay enough money. You know, and uh, no, you've got to pay. Sometimes you have to pay. You know, I'll be the first to admit that. No, you but, no I, just, I just I just admitted it. Like, you said said you'd be the first. So, you will not be the first. You can admit it, but you're not the first. But anyway, we, we need to, to look into this because we are losing a lot of revenue uh, because people are doing additions that we don't even know about. And nobody's going to say a word that somebody shows up. But they're, but they're also. You want to be tired. All right. To move yeah. On. Let's go to the yeah. Jewel property uh, bond and warning. Yeah, this is going to get Mike really worked up. Um, Lois pointed out to me <laughs> that the article that we approved uh, 
is missing a verb. Oh. <laughs> and she's absolutely right. So the article, the article as written and posted is shall the bonds of the town of Johnson in an amount not to exceed $420,000 reduced by any other available funds for the purpose of developing and improving the town of Johnson's property known as the Jewett property for the purpose of light industrial commercial development. There's no, there's no action. So one, I raised the issue with Tom this morning and Evan this morning, and because it's a bond vote, there's a specific um, notice requirement, which is different than a regular public notice requirement. And so Tom correctly submitted the proposed document to Bob Fletcher, who is a bond attorney as well as our general attorney. Correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but Bob basically came back and said, running the article as it's written would make it highly subject to nullification. Um, and we have passed the deadline for amending it within the statutory time frame. So his strong recommendation is we cancel the August 13th meeting and so repost the new meeting. Vote. The August 13th vote. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Which would the public hearing we were scheduling for the night before, I believe. Yeah. So then there's gonna have to be a separate vote on this. So it's gonna have to be a separate so it's not gonna be done the day of the it, it it would not be done the day of the uh the day of the primary. No, this was a day late. You know, all six people have been voted. Well, I was a day late getting in touch with you. Know, you. She got me on Sunday. <laughs> but here's here's the other issue. Here's the other issue, people. Um, I handed out to you a spreadsheet. The your your copy is not a nice color. But yeah, I know. Yeah. Black and white. Black. But here's the issue under uh, the column. Oh, they're not, they're not numbered. Um, I had originally put in, oh, this is the 419, this is the earlier one. Okay, so if you look um, in roughly in the middle of the column, it says town funding stack at the top of the columns. If you go all the way down to Mumley estimate of construction, there's a, a line item, $175,000 revolving loan fund. That number should not be in there. And the $419,000 that ends up under that column of the 25% contingency, that was the number, Tom, I think you said, why don't we just, why don't we just use $420,000 and we don't have to decide whether we do the 175,000 or not. That was a great idea, but the bad thing is the, 120, the 175,000 was in a column that included the total funding package. So the reality is that we need, if we're not gonna borrow the 175, and I think that's an open question right now, we actually need more like five hundred and ninety-two thousand dollars to bond, not four hundred and twenty thousand. I tell you, told you at the beginning of the meeting that was going to fail. Five ninety-two definitely would. Well, I don't know whether it will or it won't. Um, well, who knows? It's not going to be done on the day of the primary. Yeah. And so and then, Mark and I were having a little sidebar over here and. Who's going to show up for that? So the question before you, I guess, is um, I don't I don't think we can put together. We did do a resolution. So Bob Fletcher said, did you do a resolution? We did a resolution. What I can't remember is whether the resolution said $420,000. And if it did, we probably need to do a new resolution. Yeah. Um, yeah, so all that. And when, when, when does this have to be done? The funds have to be approved in September. End, end of September. By September 30th. And so, which is why I said that 
Randall earlier, don't ask about the August 15th. Right, <laughs> right. because does this push it another 30 days out if we're tinkering with it? Yes. So it would be September. That's my understanding based on what the if we got on the stick with MBRC that. language is. Yeah. Just forget about the whole thing. You vote in your favor. This is something new. Well, it, it's up for discussion again. I guess we know where you're coming from, but the, the point is if we're gonna do the warning, it needs to be changed. The language needs to be changed. Bob right. Clinton gave us some proposed language um for a new warning but i you know that's not ready for tonight um so i and that the number is going to have to be changed to 592 right good question my memory was we did the 25 percent construction contingency because that got us up to that number. So say we got the 175, then we wouldn't need, then we um then we'd be okay. We'd have 25% contingency budgeted. But if we didn't get the 175, we'd be down at 166, which put us at a 10% construction contingency. And if we needed to, we would just do a change of reduce the amount of work done. We can do that. That's um There'll be plenty of people showing. I don't, I don't, you know, we also talked with Mumley that night, I believe, and he said he wasn't uncomfortable with the 10% Absolutely. contingency. And, you know, my spreadsheet has 10, 15, and 25%. And I believe we asked at that meeting for updated instruction numbers. When are we going to see those? I'd like to know how much we've spent on this thing. Out of town funds. Forty. We purchased the property, right? But we spent other money too. Forty-six thousand five hundred dollars. And then we did that last time around. We had a planning grant for the original amount, and we got. Now I will tell you, if we cancel the whole thing, we did get. I forget how much money to do the Yellowwood market study. That was. We'll have to pay that back. That was a that was a grant from the Model Economic Development Council, in which they said if you go ahead with the project, we'll forgive the note or the grant. But if you don't go ahead with it, you got to pay it back. But how much was that? I want to say it was over twenty thousand, but I can't remember for sure. Well, I know Fisher cut here. I think we should redo. The language. I guess we we'll probably have to have another meeting this week, don't we? No. And put it back in the voters' hands. I don't want to spend any more money until the voters. Mm. Is Which has been me. Which is what tonight. And that way, it just. Oh, needs to I just want the voters to say. The what voters. Voters are going to look at. That would see. Good advice. Uh, I'm going to suggest an alternative, which Tom has suggested, which I think would be fine if. If the board votes in favor of it, we could approve the language in concept and and sign, and then we would just have to individually come in and sign the actual warning notice. Um, and if the resolution specifically said 420 as opposed to more generalized language, then we would also have to sign the resolution to change that resolution. If you make a motion, I'll second it. I would move that we modify the warning to be consistent with the language Bob Fletcher recommended uh, in the amount of $592,000. Uh, and that each board member could regularly come in and sign the warning once those changes have been made. But that still kicks the date out for the town road. Correct. It does. Yeah. So that that would need to be part of that amended yeah. motion. I, I don't know that we can set that date tonight. It would be 30 days from the third signature. 
<laughs> exactly. Which could all happen this week. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow. But I think Rosemary is, you know, the election official. I think I she's got to be part of it. It would be respectful to her to have her actually come up with a date. Is right? she on vacation somewhere? No, I don't think so. Your motion could be to approve the language and a date and approve whichever date Rosemary sees fit. And then have the resolution. And that's my motion. Yeah. All right. Are you clear on that motion, Donna? I think so. I told him I'd second it, so I'm doing it. Further discussion from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yeah. All those opposed? Aye. You already voted aye. I voted no. Oh, yeah, you I guess you did. The, last time. I, the ayes have it. And I didn't sign it last time either. It really showed us. All right. So can you, once that's done, will you send out an email to everybody telling them to come in and sign the, sign the warnings? Yes. Does that work for everybody? That works. Uh, don't worry. At this point, I'd entertain a motion to enter into a couple executive sessions. Oh, Shane, you want to do it? Don't get so good at it. He just oh, uh, did all. Of it. It's right there. You can. Um, uh, we can take them both at once, right? I think we can. All right. Uh, I'll make a motion to enter into uh, two consecutive executive sessions. The first for one BSA three thirteen A three, and the yeah. second for one BSA three thirteen A one F. Motion on the floor is there a second? Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Okay. And the board is entering executive session at nine thirty six. Sorry. Do we need to invite anyone? Tom. 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 Inviting Tom in.